This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to you again here on Safari Live. We are on a Sunday this afternoon, and the temperature is a beautiful 23 degrees Celsius, 84 degrees Fahrenheit. It is a marvelous winter morning or afternoon, should I say. It's been a beautiful day, and my name is Steve Falkenbridge. I'm joined on camera by Craig, and we are out in Jumasabi Sands, very excited on a Sunday. I had the morning off. I'm feeling very, very fresh after beautiful safari lives episode last night i was just showing you this little area here nice open plains area and this is the area that the cheetah family of the last week came into and spent some time and i know ralph kirsten had them this morning well from a distance i'm not sure if you actually saw them but we know kind of where they were hiding out and we might be able to find them again so there's our uh, idea for this afternoon to see if we can start with that so feel free to send through your comments and questions to hashtag safari live alternatively follow the youtube stream or whatever whatever other platform you do prefer how has everyone's weekend been been a marvelous weekend the weather is so nice i've been expecting some really cold weather as june comes but so far Last night was a little bit chilly, but once we get back from drive, it's, it's easy. Maybe it's because I'm living in a house now. I've been living in a tent for the last three years. Winter's in a tent. <laughs> Very cold. Because it just gets colder and colder through the night. Craig, have you ever lived in a tent in winter? No walls, no heat. So we're going to go up towards our, our northern sort of boundary, Bavosuk boundary to see that's where the cheats were seen this morning around uh, an area called Sydney's Dam. We are on the western side of Juma right now and uh, it is kind of a nice open area here called Sandy Patch. Cheats were playing just here that this is the kind of habitat you expect them to find preferable because they can see. It's also it's attracting game there's a fair bit of vegetation to feed on um, also some animals they want a bit of sort of open area to feed on such as wildebeest and zebra like to come into these areas but the cheetah are looking for him parlor but i'm not alone this afternoon on safari i'm joined also by a very nice gentleman by the name of david hello and good afternoon to all of you and welcome to a sunrise sunset rather drive my name is david and with me is Fug. Excellent. I like the way he goes this. Fantastic. I have no plans for now. I'm open to anything that you'll see. And this morning I saw the sticks, pride of lions, which have been suffering from mange, but they look much better. I've never seen them before, but I was told from what I saw and how they were a couple of months ago, they will pull it through. Sometimes we usually think mange, when it comes, it turns, if it wipes out a pride like that, it's kind of a natural way of, you know, balancing mother nature and balancing the population of some animals. Well, uh, either I'll go looking for them or maybe my other friend Raf will go do that. But at the moment, I'm just open to see anything that will come away. The leopards yesterday and today, nothing, nothing doing, not seen. I'll be happy to see some. And remember, most important, as you might be watching some nice, say, go away, but up there, we request you to ask us as many questions as you can. Please share with us your thoughts and also send us some comments. As usual, hashtag Safari Live and Mr. Gray, go away, bud. I think we're just waiting for us there for me to start the show. I'm not sure he's trying to swallow something. The other day, I saw them trying to spit or vomit some seeds. Either as now we have come to winter, they're only eating the husks, and then the hard part of the seed, they'll get it out. So that's the grey go away bird. They'll always help us sometimes when they make alarm calls, and you never know. When they talk, we listen, we follow, sometimes we see something, and sometimes we don't. Beautiful. Not a bad start in a hot afternoon here so we'll move on and we are going also to make sure we have a look with flag in every water pond that we see 
because chances are someone could be going for a drink. All right. There could be Bats going for a drink. Could be Alice. Could be anybody. Okay. Great temperatures. A bit hot, as I said, a bit warm. But again, it's time to look for animals under the sheds. But it's warm like this. Maybe much later on, I'm going to cruise through the Muruwati. A time like now, Ellis would be looking for big, huge sheds of trees that will give them more shed. You know, elephants don't like lots of heat, especially if they'll have their young ones. So that's also a plan or an area I'm thinking of visiting much later today as it cools off. But at the moment, it's every water pan. We need to have a look. And remember, we got another young man by the name of Raf. Well, welcome aboard, everybody. And um, you are now with us here in Torchwood Traverse. I've just come across the border from Juma, and you are in the Greater Kruger National Park of South Africa watching Safari Live. My name is Ralph Kirsten, looking straight into the sun. On the camera is Davi. How's it, Davi? Now, please don't forget to join us on the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and on the YouTube live chat. Send us your questions and your comments and join us on the largest game drive in the world. Now, I'm just going to turn away a little bit because my eyes are directly in the sun there. But um, we are going to be heading on to uh, Torchwood. And I'm trying this afternoon to try and catch up with the Torchwood pride of lions as well as... Who knows, maybe we'll even catch up with Tandi and Tlalamba. Uh, it's a lovely warm afternoon, so uh, expectations are that the predators maybe be a little bit flat for now. But that gives us a chance to get around Torchwood and see what's going on. Maybe we'll pick up some tracks and some other little signs. And who knows, maybe we'll even see some of those raptors up in the sky. And speaking of raptors, it seems Steve has already found one. Yes, we have found a very special raptor, actually very common in the savannah biome. I haven't seen one in some time now. I actually suggest this might be the first one I've seen this year. wonder how many of you raptor experts there are out there. You'll notice it's got a very dark eye. The legs and sear. Now, if you're not familiar with the word sear, is that's that, that sort of skin around the beak joining onto the face. So kind of the beak and the skin joining the face. It's called the sear, so the mouth really. And you see the legs are the same color. And he's doing a very characteristic thing. He's got one foot actually dangling there at the moment as he rests it. It's quite characteristic of this species. And also the posture, very straight back. Do you see how upright it stands? Something snake eagles do. There we go, and I is holding the leg right up. Very characteristic. For this species of bird. I wonder how many of you out there know what this is, if you've seen it before. As I said, it's quite a common bird in the savannah biome, but I haven't seen one in some time. Mmm, grateful dad, it is not a gymnogene. A gymnogene, yes, does have the potential to get a red face, but very, very different. A gymnogene is a harrier hawk, it's a very big bird. Um, yes, it doesn't have feathers on the legs like this bird. But the gymnogene, bear in mind, has got an entire sort of skin pouch of a face, whereas this is just the beak. Nick, you are an absolute champion. You got that spot on. Now, there's one bird that gets confused with this one, but is far smaller and doesn't have um, as big a body size and doesn't stand with that upright sort of shape. Nick has guessed it correct. I thought it immediately when I saw it. Um, but you can confuse it with the Gabar Gosok, which is a little bit smaller. Um, coloration of the legs and the sear are the same, but they do not stand with that upright. Yeah, we can hear it call now. It was calling. That's a contact call. It's not the actual call that it does. It was just a little cheap, cheap. I'm going to actually play the call for you. And then we can actually hear it. 
little contact call there. See if he responds to this call. It is, in fact, the dark chanting Gossok, ladies and gentlemen. So if you got that correct, well done. So bear in mind, remember that very straight back. Now, listen, I'm going to play it on my phone. See if it responds. Ooh. Only going to play it once. Definitely piqued his interest, didn't it? Or her interest. There's no real difference in the sexes. There might be a slight difference in size. But really, really, you know, the female's slightly bigger. Slightly, slightly bigger than the male. Very nice to see, though. So although it's not the biggest of raptors in the world, they will feed on birds as large as guinea fowl. And their hunting strategy is exactly what it's doing. It likes to perch. It's not much of a pursue hunter. There we go. There's the facial shot. It doesn't really pursue too many, too many birds. It's not the biggest. It's not the smallest of raptors, but it's not the biggest either. So it really, it waits, sees something as big as a guinea fowl, will take lizards and snakes, and it more likely just flops down on top of them. Very interesting, that little contact call. So the, the clue, clue, clue that's happening, that little clicking, potentially might be a youngster. Mina Moo, very good question. I mean, it's something we see all the time. Uh, when you're a, a bird with a big, r relatively large wingspan, you'd think, the large raptors and especially vultures are very, very important to, for that. They're very big. They're not the, the most agile of birds, a vulture, so they're quite clumsy. So they want to go up into a, a tree that's not going to snag their wings. So they either land on top of a tree with their nest or when they perch, it's on a dead tree like this. So they can just jump down and sort of fly into, into the air without any branches or leaves getting in the way. Um, none of us would really know that because we never spend any time jumping. But go climb up into a tree like that. If you want to jump into a pool or a, a dam and you want to jump out of a tree, which tree do we choose? The tree with no leaves or the tree with a thousand branches and leaves in the way? It's definitely about space and about accessing, the obviously, their, their, their wings in and out of the tree. Not just the landing, but also the leaving. But then also if they're sitting there for perching for maybe for drying themselves from the sun, they need to be exposed to the sun. Or if you're a perched specialist waiting to hunt, you need to be able to have a maximum field of view. Otherwise, uh, you've kind of not picked the right spot. So the way it's facing, it's got a full sort of view in front of it and everything moving around. Enjoying the sunshine and probably looking for some food. Okay, well, we're going to move on, see if we can find tracks of our cheetah shortly but maybe a few more questions on these if you'd like send them through no more questions what a lovely bird we're going to move on then to uh to the northern side see if we can find any wonderful cheetah tracks because as you know the long-standing viewers if you're a new viewer well cheetah are renowned for moving in the daytime it's a known as a diurnal daytime sort of animal it's kind of in response to the competition there it flies oh we missed the money shot Craigo <laughs> it hunts in the daytime to avoid the competition against lion and hyena during the night Monique when it comes to playing bird calls um, it, you need to be very careful in the breeding season you can affect the breeding a territorial family will be a surprise by the call it might be louder than and also you should never play it louder than their call if you do play it you've got to play it once let a bird respond and then you stop playing it all together um, but if you play it again and again and again you're going to disrupt the breeding and you might even displace completely displace a breeding pair or territorial pair because um, the call they hear is louder or it's more incessant than them and you can completely affect their life so it's very important to be ethical when it comes to playing calls Play it once, see if there's a response, 
leave it. If you're walking looking for a special or, or sort of cryptic colored or hidden bird, never more than once every 100 meters or so. But there you're changing areas. And then a bird will jump out. They respond very quickly to calls, but must also make sure you're not too loud. Match the sort of pitch that that bird's going to play it at. Otherwise, it's like a, you know, trying to sing against someone who's Pavarotti. You know, you're just not going to try compete. You're either just going to leave. Now, are we going to go check a watering hole? And it seems like someone else has found someone drinking. Yes, and uh, look at that giraffe there. How lucky to see a giraffe drinking. We have not seen this for quite some time. And we saw one behind it, and we just discussed with Fag. Maybe they might go for a drink and just getting closer. Just look at that. They'll always spread their legs out to be able to reach water because of their long necks. But at the same time, the worry of being preyed on by predators is always very big. This is very special for me to see a giraffe and having its shadow in the back and its reflection in the water and the actual giraffe splayed out legs there. Very well done job, Fag. And as much of concern of so much, you know, blood remaining in the head, they need to bring their heads up. The biggest concern is getting preyed on when they're drinking by either lions, because they have known from experience, predators like lions will hang around the watering holes and come and hunt them when they're drinking. Hi, big boy. Track marker, I have seen that mark there. It has actually two marks if you look carefully. And being a male, you're asking what's wrong with his neck. Being a male, males usually fight a lot. Males usually fight a lot. And I think this one has had a few fights. And if you try to calculate or estimate the headbutt of an osico or giraffe's horn, that's where most likely it keeps hitting when it swings its head or when the other one will swing its head because they use the horns to fight or the oscars to fight, chances are that is where it gets because we call it necking and the oscars will always hit at that particular point if you just estimate the rough height for both of them. You see, got two marks there, one on top and the other one there. My guess is those comes from the fights they usually go through. It's very typical for males to fight. Females rarely fight. It's a great, great comment and great observation there. Sorry, what did Angie ask? To what do you have to about the water? Uh, they just slap it and then straight to the mouth. They're not able to suck, just like how the cats, you know, will drink. They just slap the water. I think, sorry, there's a car that moved in the background there. Must have spoked it a little bit. And, of course, I'm not sure the giraffe saw it or knew what it was. It did not want to take any chances. And that's why it's leaving the water hole. And that was really something. You see its challenge of going up there because of its height. All right, from one drinking animal to another drinking animal. Well, everyone, let's hope that the gremlins stay away. Sorry about that. The previous um, picture that we had of this lovely bull elephant who is in high must. And when we first spotted him, I'm not sure which part of the story you got. Um, he came towards us with a very intense swagger. And uh, when you do note that bull elephants are in must, it's best to stay out of their way because they do very often cause nonsense and they're very irritable. And so at, when you spot that and the very clear indicator 
is that they're actually leaking from the penis area, dribbling a lot there. If you can see, there's little dribbles there, and that's actually coming from the penis, um, and very wet in, uh, you know, in between the back legs, a, a very, very clear indicator that a bull is in must. Another way, they do also at this time leak from the temporal gland, but we don't uh, often say to people that that's what you should use as an indicator, because they will also leak from the temporal gland when they're not in must. It's purely uh, a stress indicator. It's a bit of an emotional uh, or triggered by emotion. So obviously when they do have all this testosterone coursing through their blood, uh, it will also um, result in their emotions being quite highly strung. Now, he, um, he also does, as I was saying, uh, react with a swagger um, towards anything that presents itself towards him um, and a vehicle a nice big vehicle like this he might think of it as another big elephant and he just wants to come over and prove himself as a as a man as a big boy as a, you know um, and this testosterone uh, fueled period is very important for elephants because it drives male uh, bulls like this to go and join with the herd and um, obviously seeking out females and uh, if it wasn't for that well we'd probably run out of elephants because the males do like to wander off on their own and only really rejoin the herd when this testosterone starts pumping through their blood it can however be very stressful for the herd Ashley, you say he's got very nice big tusks. I agree with you. They're very, they're very thick tusks. Um, it seems like they might be a bit brittle on the end. I wasn't, I don't think I actually saw if they were nice and smooth. But he, he is a very good-looking individual. He's a rather large elephant. I have seen bigger, but um, uh, I haven't seen too many much bigger than him uh, around here. So very, very nice, good-looking elephant. But uh, as I was saying, it can be quite stressful for the breeding herd because um, he, he wants to force himself on them, you know. Uh, Monique, it, it can be a little bit uncomfortable for for the males. It's um, you know, it's uh, I, I wouldn't think that you've ever experienced any any kind of um, uh, not that I have either. It's taking steroids or just getting into a really frustrated time that uh, everything irritates you. And um, well, it also comes down to a sexual thing for for these elephants too. They really are looking for the girls, and um, uh, with the frustration of not having them um, it does sort of heighten that uh, you know sort of emotional state that they're in so they're just aggressive or irritated with everything that comes near them and as I say the first thing he did was really come towards us in a very intent motion of out of my way boys otherwise I'm gonna flatten you so that's you know very easily um, identified by experience of being around big bull elephants like this I've had them like this on foot uh, and uh, over 20 years I've had you know um, I can't count how many times I've been around elephants like this. So I understand um, that it's just keep your space and he will then continue as he is now, um, normally losing uh, interest with you after, you know, a few minutes. If you get remember that at this time you keep yourself a nice escape route. So if he did have to spin around now and come towards us, then we'd head off. And speaking of head off, it seems the gremlins are attacking again. Let's head. Uh, I'm not sure what he has. I think we're having a reptile now. After having some two male giraffes almost coming to a fight, and they were almost necking, and they hit each other very hardly, and it was quite a big bang we had. And I'm guessing we might be having a monitor lizard doing a little swim here. I've never seen a crocodile in this water hole. And it might be a kind of a, looks like a monitor lizard to me. Very good look, 100%. Yes, it's a monitor lizard. I've always seen them by the bank or by the side of the water. But this one is having some beautiful fun. Thank you, Luke. It's having great fun in the water. Look at it, just feeling good and enjoying the swim there. And wanging its tail left to right. 
Ha! Huh. Hopefully nothing is bringing it down because if there were crocs here, would you imagine maybe there could be a crocodile trying to bring it down and eat it? But it's just enjoying and having a great time here in the water. And this is one big difference between these lizards and the rock monitors because these ones will be found in and out of water. And many times you have always mistaken them for crocodiles or baby crocodiles from a distance. And yes, surely it is a monitor lizard. You can see the head out. Ruby, you say, this is so cool. I'm also enjoying it here with Fag, and we are seeing for me something I've not seen before. A monitor lizard in water and just having its best. And you'll notice once in a while it's have with its tongue out because they need the tanks out to smell the air. Abigail, you're asking how big can they grow? Some of these can go up to 1.5 meters, Abigail. 1.5 meters is how big they can grow and they weigh a lot more than the rock uh, monitors. So this one could go up to 1.5, sometimes 1.8 meters in length and I'm sure it's deciding to come out of the water after having a nice swim. How cool is this? Yes, Abigail, you can see it now. So anything 1.5 to 1.8 is typical length for a monitor lizard. It will definitely come out just how you come out of the pool and you want to warm up a little bit. But it also have to be sure what's happening on the outside world. And the tongue is always out every one or two seconds. And if you look, the tongue carefully at the very end is slipped into two. And they use the tongue to smell the air. And that way, from the air, they can tell if there's any prey close by or any enemy close by. And even if there's prey, they are also able to know what prey it is and even the distance just by smelling the air and the tongue being split into two or like into two lobes as you see like sometimes in the snakes it helps it to grab more information chromic you're asking is the monitor lizard dangerous for humans no it is not uh, in general monitor lizards have not been known to attack humans and for example if they come out of the canal chromic the monitor lizard will either go back in the water or it will move away and I'll tell you what they are very very fast you saw it slowly and slugging trying to come out of the water when you see them full speed whoo they are very fast very very fast creatures because that's one of their best defense you know mechanism taking off to flee speed because they have not been known to fight back very well Always they blend in very well, especially the front part of the head. They blend in very well. So my from Dive Live, how are you? And very good for having launched the Dive Live. People very excited. We were yesterday and that's a second one of the Monish Lizard. And I'm sure this could be a pair and they could be mating. That's my guess. But I tell you, in this particular waterhole, we have not seen or personally I have never seen a crocodile here maybe today but it's not easy just a crocodile just to come out of the blues this particular water hole here we call the twin water hole does not have any crocs but again you never know but I've never seen any crocs here and maybe that's one of the reasons these monitor lizards are going in there with a lot of confidence because we have known crocodiles have gone for monitors and have you know killed them and eaten them you see, the movement is very different from a croc when they move. So these ones tend to remain a bit clear from the ground. And you see crocs tend to move like with their bellies right on the surface of the ground. And you can tell the drag marks of a monitor lizard and of a crocodile are very different. The third one also. Minamu, that's a perfect question. As far as showing us a third monitor lizard, I've never seen this. Minamu, I have always seen monitor lizards mating outside the water. 
anything could be possible, but in general, because of the way they would meet, they would meet Minamu, they would meet out in the water, could be more, I would guess, well, more comfortable for them than inside the water. Now, some, something interesting could be happening here because we have seen a third one, which is quite unusual, and they all look to be in the same size. And this, I could be wrong, might tell me we could be having some breeding time here. And either the two males after one female, but I don't remember seeing even two Montaliza together. Now, not two, we got three. So it keeps the tongue out because that way it's able to know where the other one is. Just look, it's just following it up. And as I said before, the tongue is very important to the monitor lizards. That's how they're able by smelling or getting a scent of the air, they can estimate the distance of the other monitor lizard and they can know if they can't see it, they'll have a rough idea exactly where it is. I'd be more than happy if they could come out and you see them mating, you know. Definitely, I got a feeling there's a bit of uh, love in the air here. Seeing three of them together, there could be some maybe mating going on. Maybe not now. Could be later or it could have happened. But to see three mountain lizards together, it's very unusual. And the three of them to me look the same size. Ah, good. I mean, uh, there's a, a bit of theory for me. Either they are fighting or mating, and if they're fighting, why could they be fighting? So I'm trying to imagine if they're fighting, they could be fighting over mating. But at the moment, I haven't seen actual mating going on, and that's why I'm sticking here for quite some time and find out what exactly will transpire. Any, you're asking if the monitor lizards are more comfortable in water or out of water? I will say it will depend on the situation they find themselves in. If, say, the predator that will go for them, you know, it's not, sub, it's not you know, they don't easily get it, get them in the water, they may choose to stay in the water. But if they know out of the water, they'll flee and take off, they'll be more comfortable out of the water. Any, it will always depend on the situation or where they find themselves to be. But if they're near water, chances are they would easily go underwater and hide. Some of the monte lizards, like this one here, the water monte lizard, we have known them that they can go underwater for as long as one hour. You'd imagine how they do that, I do not know. But unlike hippos that will go underwater three, four, five minutes, the monitor lizards will go underwater for a very long time. So I need, my guess is in a situation like where we are now, if there is a concern of maybe an animal like a crocodile that will not go and get them underwater, they will definitely be more comfortable underwater. Something is definitely going on here if you look at their behavior. child of the universe uh, monitor lizards territorial I would say yes there's one particular one we have always seen here the only thing I would say monitor, uh, child of the universe we have not done is maybe to know it or to mark it or like how we have known our leopards here with the spot patterns I think it's high time we started uh, you know identifying these monitor lizards because every two three days either me or one of the other guides will come here and see a particular monitor lizard on this waterhole and i think it's time we find out my guess is yes at, but i'm not 100 percent sure but my guess is child of the universe i think they could be territorial this one's complete now out of the water and again you can see it has a clear difference from the water Sorry, I missed that question from Sean. Can their tongues work underwater? Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, uh, Sean. Uh, your question is, can their tongues work underwater? Yes, their tongues are designed in a way that even while underwater, they can throw them out. But I guess maybe more outside the water than in water because if you look at that one particularly shown there the tongue is out more outside the water than in the water what should happen is they need to get the air because it's the air or the droplets out in the air they need 
to smell and get the scent to identify their prey, to identify where the other one is, to know what's happening in their outside world. And then very quickly, they bring them back into what you call the Jacobson's organ and they read the data or the information they picked. I would guess the tanks are more equipped to work outside the water than inside the water because I don't think they are going to read very well inside the water. This is pretty exciting. I still didn't want to find out what could be happening here. And Steve got some feathered friends. Yes, we found a guinea fowl, helmeted guinea fowl, and we were talking earlier about the the goshawk, the dark chanting goshawk. And this would be a food source that they would definitely be after, which is very interesting. The guinea fowl weighs about 1.3 kilograms or so. Which is what that's about three pounds and the dark chanting goshawk weighs maximum six six hundred seven hundred grams so it's almost twice the size or, or twice the weight marvelous that it would be able to pursue or catch a bird like this and very likely feeds on quite a lot of it before maybe flying up into the tree and i do apologize i was doing some reading before the dark chanting goshawk does actually pursue some fast prey, but it's not its primary form of hunting. It spends a lot of its time waiting on a perch, like the gabar goshawk and the shikra, and the little sparrowhawk, which are more pursue specialists. They do pursue fast-moving birds through the through the undergrowth or through the thickets. Sparrowhawk and shikra being a specialist in that. Marvelous. Imagine being able to kill something twice your size or twice your weight. And then what do you do? You can't eat all of it. Definitely for some hungry chicks, I would say. But you can tell it's quite a warm afternoon. Guinea fowl enjoying some respite in the shade there. Um, I wonder with those cheetah cubs, if we found them, would they chase after some guinea fowl? That would be quite funny, quite something to see. But uh, we didn't find any tracks of them coming in. So very likely they're still in the north there, maybe. They've moved off further north, who knows? It's one of those things. If you don't find the tracks, you can just assume. Well, you can't assume anything, really, if you haven't found any activity. I don't want to disturb these guinea fowl. They are enjoying. I'm going to just stop, Craig. I don't want to chase them out of their little shady spot. If we have a look at them again, you can actually see the difference between the three of them. The one on the left and the one on the far right have got a different sized cast on the head. And the one in the middle is a lot smaller. Can you see that? I'm wondering if it is a juvenile, the one in the middle, that's just coming into sort of plumage. It's just growing. Guinea fowl were breeding just a few months ago. And they grow very, very quickly. Very important buffer food for lots and lots of predatory animals around here. And we don't know actually how many guinea fowl actually get fed upon by leopards and cheetah and caracal and serval. As James has said before about scrub here, we don't know how many of them get fed upon because it's just such a quick and easy meal and you don't really find the remains like you do of a big kill. Samu, age nine, very good question. I just need to correct myself first. Now that one in the middle has moved its head and it now looks the same as the other, so it was just a bit of a trick of the light. Samu, age nine, you want to know if there's any other, any other birds named after the name? And the boo-boo is named after their name. They make a lot of boo-boo sounds. Um, and we get the southern down here. Up north, you get the tropical boo-boo. And there's also the, a bird called the bok makiri, because they make a noise called bok, bok, bok makiri. So that's an interesting one. I think there's a couple others that I'm trying to think of. 
uh, most of the Afrikaans names, so sort of like the old South African language of Afrikaans, which is a mixture of Dutch and German, a little bit of French, a little bit of Malaysian in there as well. They, a lot of their names for birds is named after what they sound like. Like the go-away bird is called a quack quack fool, a, a quack quack bird, because that's the noise it makes. A lot of the bird names and animal names that they've named are actually specifically because of what they sound like. So very descriptive language Afrikaans in every way and form. They just sneak around these guys. You guys move into the bushes there. Well, it seems like David's monitor lizards have already mated and possibly produced babies. <laughs> well, I don't know what Steve is talking about. This by now they might have babies because now we are seeing much better. It's like one fully grown one and two young ones. You can see one moving there. That's a pretty young baby very very young and I think uh, it was hiding under a hole maybe when all the commotion was going on it just came out from the hole and want to join the rest because now we're seeing like three fully grown ones and the tiny baby is trying to move slowly we have those two there and very good fun and we've got a third one there and they must have made a baby very quickly. Minamu, very good question. Do animals get sunburned? I think so. If all any animals apart from the hippos are too much out on the sun, they would get sunburned. And that's why you'll always see, for example, reptiles like what you're watching now, the monta lizards, if it gets definitely too hot for them that go in the water. I'm not very sure of reptiles, for example, but I would say hippos would get sunburned definitely if they're out in the water for a long time. But I think the other animals, I would say, in Africa have adopted and maybe are not able to get, you know, sunburned. Unless, of course, they're very young ones, like small, young elephant calves or a young, you know, monte lizard like this one moving. I highly doubt they get uh, sunburn. They're very well designed with their skins and their scales to protect them from the sun. Do you want to go back in the water? Would you be more comfortable in the water? Are you looking for something to eat? Let's find out where she wants to go. My guess is go in the water and cool yourself. Or you want to learn how to use your tongue? You can see. And you're asking whether they, oops, oh, abandon their babies while they're still in the eggs. Normally the females will come back to the eggs to hatch them because that time they are hatching them or the times they hatch, it's always very crucial. They'll get other animals that may come and prey on them. For example, jackals. So the females will always come back, Angie, to make sure when the hatching is complete, they get to move with their babies and I'm talking of either crocodiles or even monte lizards they need to take them to safe areas for example like in water or in big holes where they'll hide them to see them mature and grow so females will always time when they're about to hatch and make sure they help in breaking the eggs and taking them to safety they need to help them like you know to show them around and from there they'll be able to survive she seems to be on the move. I'm not sure where she wants to go, but my guess was she would have gone either in a hole or she's just learning her ropes and using her tongue to smell food. When she becomes mature, she'll be quite good and I'm sure the mother will be like, well done. I think she's chasing some insects. Must you asking what do they eat? They'll eat eggs of small little birds. They'll eat insects, any rodents they get. And, you know, any shrimps around the water area, they'll feed with all that. And they could be going in there to look if there's anything they can grab. I'm not sure if they got anything, Masi, there. And they'll also be preyed also preyed upon by big egos.
Gemma, how are you? And yeah, will a big monitor lizard eat a smaller one? I highly doubt that would happen. Maybe, unless it's a scenario of, say, a water monitor lizard eating, I would say, a rock monitor lizard by virtue of uh, the water monitor lizard being bigger in size than the rock lizard. But that would be when maybe there's a situation of hunger or drought or they don't have much to eat. But that really happens. I haven't seen that or I have not, you know, had it documented by anybody. I would highly doubt that would happen, but there could be a scenario. I mean, this one's when fully grown, as I said, they're much bigger and almost twice the weight of the rock monitor lizards. She's definitely busy looking for something. By the way, you see the tongue out. Actually, sorry, I may not be able to know how the how big the eggs are. I may be able to find out that for you. Uh, well, but my guess would be slightly bigger or maybe two times as big. As trying to imagine the monitor lizard hatchling coming out, maybe the size of two chicken eggs. But that's sheer guess. But I'm sorry, Ashley, I have no idea how big they are. But I'm sure at one point I'll be finding out and let you know on the next drive. Beautiful pattern this one has, eh? We still continue enjoying this monitor lizards here, finding out what they want to do. And let's find out where Raf is heading to right now. Well, everyone on uh, Torchwood Traverse, there's a couple of roads. The one is called Lion Track, and this road that I'm on now is called Lion Tree Road. So I'm just trying all the lion roads in the hope that we find the Torchwood Pride of Lions. Uh, because I thought that might be our best bet. And last time, the first time I was on Torchwood, we, uh, we went on Lion Track and found the Torchwood Pride. So I've just done that now. We didn't find them, but uh, now on Lion Tree Road, uh, sort of in the southern section of the Torchwood Traverse, um, just trying to see. It's been very quiet after we saw that elephant at Leadwood dam or Leadwood waterhole which is right next to Torchwood Lodge um, we haven't seen too much else in the way of big or, or mammals so we've seen some birds lots of trees of course because we could never say that we haven't seen anything it was one of the most frustrating things that I always used to hear from my students when uh, when I was an instructor for one of these um, wildlife training colleges and uh, I used to often say to them when they got back from their game drive, well, what did you guys see? And the guys go, mm, yeah, nothing, eh? And I'm like, hey, how did you not see anything? Because the basis of guiding comes down to trees and birds. Because on every single drive, you will see trees, you will see birds. So I can never say that I have not seen anything because uh, I didn't drive with my eyes closed. Otherwise, uh, we would have been gotten by that elephant to start with, uh, if we even made it there. So, lots of things to be seen. We're just um, obviously trying to find something special that we can sit and watch, and uh, that it's nice and interesting. I like to sort of concentrate on birds and trees when we're walking. Now, Tebojo, the beauty about the Greater Kruger National Park here in South Africa is that um, it's, a, it's, it's an area the size of Israel. It's about 2.2 million hectares. And uh, the animals do move um, across this entire space. And sometimes it's sort of like mini migrations. It can almost seem like there's no animals here. And then uh, you come around a bend in a road and there's, it's just full of animals. Um, and that can be sort of just from little area to little area and also from time to time. Uh, you know, on Juma, sometimes it's full of elephants, and at other times you, you really struggle to find even one. And then other times there's, uh, uh, you know, up to 10 leopards in the area, and uh, 30 lions, and then other times it seems like they're all gone. But they move and groove as they feel fit because they are wild and free, and that's the beauty of it. We come out here never knowing what to expect, and, well, all we can do is put our um, selves in the right places at the right time. And normally it's just the luck of the draw. But the longer you're out there looking for 
things and trying also to work out where the animals have been moving and try to work out a little bit of a pattern then you can try and catch up with them but um, like this morning with the cheetah um, at least we know that they're right on the boundary of Juma and I'm very much hoping that they possibly cross back into Juma this afternoon and Steve's in that area just checking um, hopefully he gets lucky over that side well we're also hoping that we get lucky with the wildlife uh, Enki, thanks for saying you like my philosophy. Oh, here we go to Bojo. Here's some antelope. And we should never discriminate between antelope because we get overly excited about some rarer species. But if it wasn't for impala, there wouldn't be a lot of the predators around that we find on a regular basis because they form a major part of the food source of um, these predators around here, especially leopard. So we need to be thankful for the presence of impala, I would say. Some of, some of the time they do also uh, feed on warthogs, but uh, a lot of the time impala. Now, Scott, there are some animals that do move in and out of the Kruger National Park, and um, those animals, mostly the warthogs, jackals, leopards, caracal, um, and, and any number of other smaller little creatures, like genet and civet, uh, you know, they can very easily get under the fences. And it's very often down to jackals and warthogs that make um, the, the holes, or the, it's like burrow-like holes underneath the electric fences, and then that makes it easier for other animals to sort of cross that boundary as well. But uh, I've even seen leopards jumping over a three-meter electrified fence. So it's not impossible for them to go over as well. Just in general, they'll take the easier route, which would normally be uh, underneath through a warthog burrow as well. DS, yes, there are borders. The Greater Kruger National Park of South Africa does border on um, Zimbabwe uh, Mo and Mozambique. So uh, at Crook's Corner, right at the uh, corner of South Africa, we, we can look at three countries. We can be standing in South Africa and we can throw a stone across to either Zimbabwe or Mozambique. And that's Crook's Corner. That's the meeting of the mighty Limpopo and the Levuvu River. Right at that corner is the, the boundary of, the, uh, of South Africa, uh, Zimbabwe and Mozambique. But that's part of the Greater Kruger National Park because remember it's a transfrontier park it does go across into Zimbabwe and Mozambique as well um, so the rivers literally form the boundary between the countries and on the outer edges of the national park it is then fenced so you know there are places sometimes where it, uh, the fence is down and that needs to be monitored and then the guys would repair it and and fix it up now, Adele, the, this part, uh, you know, the, the, the agreement with the sand parks or, or the South African national parks would be with these um, uh, private property owners, like in the Sabi Sands, they would need to be fencing the perimeter sufficiently that it would be keeping elephants and lions in specific inside and also to keep people out. So that's the major goal of, an, uh, you know, the, the boundary of national parks. I would say in the major part, it's actually to keep people out. Um, so that is uh, how the, the uh, private landowners would then obviously, in order for them to benefit from the Greater Kruger National Park and all the animals that would then move in and out of their property, they would need to sufficiently have fenced off their perimeter and there would obviously be stringent controls and um, there's each and every single person that comes in on into the Sabi sands uh, pays an entrance fee and that all goes to the greater um, conservation maintenance of these uh, of these particular areas both for the roads the fences the staff um, not in terms of the lodges not staff for the lodges but staff for maintaining the fences for anti-poaching and a very important part being that of road maintenance because if left alone roads will be probably your primary source of erosion and degradation of your land so they need to keep that all up to scratch and uh, 
you know, they would have a management team, a conservation management team that would be having their targets and goals for the year and uh, all the different things that they would need to be um, completing as a part of their uh, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly schedules and making sure that it's all up to scratch in line with the sand parks. Now, Scott, the poaching problem in the Kruger has obviously escalated in the in the last 10 years, um, the majority being around uh, rhino and the obvious um, uh, very lucrative side that rhino horn brings on the black market. So that has attracted a lot of poaching into uh, the Kruger National Park. And the Sabi Sands is no different, obviously, with the Sabi Sands being um, more of a sort of private entity within this. Um, public uh, government entity. They do have a little bit more, I would, I would say, uh, in the way of uh, input monetary-wise in a smaller area. Um, so their teams, uh, their poaching teams would maybe be a little bit more efficient, but it's, it's mostly down to them having a smaller area to work with. Remember those uh, national, uh, the, the parks um, anti-poaching Teams, they've got massive, massive tracts of land to deal with, and so it's, it's, a, it's, it's an unenviable task for those guys having to protect that, that huge tract of land. And then you've also got the problem of it being a transfrontier park, so you've, you've got um, guys coming across the border, South Africans going across to that side. It's, 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 it's almost impossible to control. Um, but the guys do do their best. Um, but it, uh, overall, I would say that they probably are fighting a losing battle um, because the numbers have dropped in terms of poaching incidents. But um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not much of a cynist, but um, I do probably think that the major reason why the poaching incidences have decreased is because there's less, there's less rhino around to poach. Anyway, uh, that's, a, that's a story for another day. Let's carry on, try to find these lions. Uh, while I do, off to Steve. Well, we are on our northern boundary right now, just having one last look to see if those cheetah come back in. Uh, Rexon from Juma followed them this morning, and they sort of went north east ish from where they were. So. Because they move in the day, there's always that opportunity that they could have come back across. So I'm just checking the, the road. This is quite a quite a busy road as well because there's an access to a few of the lodges and landowners on this side. So tricky to see the tracks, but um, it is important to check roads like this to see if anything comes in and out. That's what we do quite often, especially in the mornings. But if you're looking for cheetah, they very be moved during the day. So good time to do that. Boundary Patrol, as it's commonly known. And so we're going to keep going here. And if they haven't come in by the next kilometer or so, we're going to go back in towards where Tandi and Kalamba were last seen last night. I believe um, someone tried to follow up this morning but didn't find any tracks. Maybe they weren't 100% sure where she was. So Craig and I are going to go there, see if we can find any, uh, any leftovers of that. Maybe they're still there. If not, we'll figure out where the closest water is from that section and then uh, follow on from there and see how lucky we can be. It'd be nice to see the little Tlalamba with some light. I know lots of you are screaming and going, yes, please, we'd love to see Tlalamba. Well, as it's notorious for this northern section, this big drainage we're about to go through, the signal gets a bit, bit sneaky. So let's quickly go to David while I get through this dark patch. Oh, yeah, we don't want us, uh, Steve, uh, losing signal. Some areas are always, you know, up and down, and uh, it would happen. The signal disappears, but we are doing well. We are on the, I would say, we are facing what? Southwest boundary, and there was some news of the newcomers. They've been spotted somewhere. I just got the news over my game drive radio, and I'm trying to find out if I can reach there, and hopefully they'll be out. Having seen the sticks this morning, I don't mind seeing my second pride of lions in one day, which will be pretty exciting. Temperatures getting better. That could be an impossible mission there. <laughs> Go ahead, Minamu.
Minamu, hi, thank you for keeping us busy. Can two prides of lions mingle with each other? I don't think so. As much as we say the males are territorial, also the females are equally territorial and mainly for one reason, food, food. So it's not possible to see them, you know, going for each other. And we have even seen, we have always thought it's only males that fight, you know, for territory or for females or for food or for some other resources like that. But females, I can tell you, also go for each other. So should the territories, Minamu, overlap? We have seen the lead females, for example, in the Nukumas, we're talking the amber eye or the one that got a wound. We have seen the mature or the leaders in the parade of lions, you know, going for each other. So yes, that would not happen. And, you know, ideally, in ideal conditions, we wouldn't have two parades of lions, you know, sharing even food, live alone food, even a territory. They always make sure you keep to our territory and you keep to ours. But what will happen is we have seen them crisscrossing territories, you know, they'll overlap. We'll see the sticks, say, in the Juma area, just going through. They disappear for a couple of days. And then you see the Nukuhumas still come through. But to see them so close to each other is quite an issue. And the same case would apply to the males, you know, the avocados, the Birmingham boys, they always have separate spaces. So they'll always want to respect their spaces. And that reduces a lot of conflict. So we're going to just follow on that lead and hopefully see whether we are going to see the Nukumas that I have not... Uh, I, see, I saw them last night, that was very interesting, just laying down as usual by some water pan after having feasted the whole day and they were very, they were in very good spirit and today the sticks had eaten some uh, water back, I think yesterday. So we'll find out what the Nkumas want to do today or if they want to go for another kill, who knows. But as per last night when I left them, the bellies were looking very good. I've been asking my question, myself a question, where are the males? I mean, uh, could be going to two weeks or three maybe. We haven't even had them, you know, either roaring or any trucks being seen somewhere. No news, and it has been very quiet. I'm not sure the Birmingham's having been here longer than the avocas. I'm like, they're like, okay, we don't want to be involved in a fight because the lions are equally intelligent. When they realize, well, we might be hard to a fight, they might be quiet, but either way, where are the avocas? No males for the last couple of weeks. Ngolo, you're asking at what age will the male lions leave the pride? Anything three to four years, they're quite good, mature, and at three, four years, they'd be good to go and live their life and maybe go establish their own coalition, go join a new coalition, or, you know, something like that. But three, four years is a good age for them to leave. And of course, I'm sure you know the females will always stick around as much as by about two and a half years, they're sexual, sexually mature, they'll stick around with the pride and they'll not go anywhere. But three, four years, the males have established a bit of main strength and they can go and introduce themselves to a coalition of males. But once in a while, you'll see a male by itself or two before it gets a coalition. Sorry, go again for the question from Child of the Universe. Uh, if I got the question right, is it how well they define the boundary of the, the territory? Sorry, go down. Yes, and tell the universe, how are you? And your question is how well they define the boundaries of the territory. A few things come in play, and one is always the resources of food and how big the habitat is. And males will always scent mark as usual. They also roar and that one marks the size or the acreage of the territory they want to be in. That's what really counts. Of course, if the habitat is small and not much resources, then also the area of the territory is equally small. And we've got a small vulture here, and this is the hooded vulture. Quite a special place it got. 
blending in very well there. I'm not sure if that stocks of a cracker somewhere or a kill somewhere or it's waiting to. Oops! <laughs> See a hornbill there. I mean, uh, I like a like breasted roller trying to intimidate the vulture to leave. I do not know why she behaved that way. She came like almost to the vulture's head, you know, and almost poked it with a beak. And the vulture was like, get out of here, I'm bigger than you. That's the beautiful lilac like breasted roller. Always they stand out in Africa of all the beautiful birds we got here. These ones always stand out for their beauty. And this is my favorite bird. All the beautiful colors they got. And one of the best things when you see them looking down and looking for prey, either bees or beetles on the ground, and they just fly right down, pick them up, and back to where they are and feed them, or rather feed on them. One of the smallest birds with lots of colors in it. Very difficult to tell males from females. He's having a look at the vulture. Vince, you say this is very beautiful. I agree with you, and I'm sure you might have heard me saying it's my favorite bird. It is so beautiful, and especially when you see them in flight, you know, they're just unbelievable. They spread out, you see greens in them, lilacs in them, whites in them. Compare it to the vulture there, which is much bigger, and it doesn't look well. It's equally beautiful by own, you know, status. They need maybe to blend in. But the lilacs are always fantastic, as I said, especially in flight. Quite an issue to see the hooded vulture on its own here. They'll be in twos, threes, fours. Well, vultures, tell us where your friends are. But in the meantime, let's go to Steve and find out what he's up to. Thanks, David. Well, we have come back to, well, back into Juma, away from the the northern boundary. So we no signs of the cheetah for us at the moment. But uh, we are not far away from where we left Tundi and a little rebellious cub last night. So we're just having a look, see if there's any sign, fresh sign of anything coming out. And we'll go in there quickly, see if there's anything left I doubt there'd be anything left of that carcass and in most likely they've moved off but will have to give us a bit of an idea ideally in the morning it would be the best time to to try and find them but no one found any tracks in and around here so maybe the entire time they have still been in there will we be lucky Well, no wonder, of course I will be, of course. Monday morning, actually, um, Taylor almost wanted to swap uh, shifts with me. And then I said, no, I can't. I've got to be on in the morning. I have promised a medicinal Monday morning, which is tomorrow. So bear in, be prepared. I am doing a wonderful tree tomorrow. We're just going to go off here. She wasn't far off the road here yesterday. Actually, that's not the one. The next track will be the best one to access. It will take us directly towards where we left her with that little Dacre. Wasn't that cute, her running around with that Dacre kill? Stealing it from mum? Naughty little girl? She is definitely becoming a very fine young leopard. And we are very, very lucky be able to spend this time with them those of you who've been watching the show we've been documenting her from the day pretty much the day she was born which is really something special I only started in January and got to spend pretty much almost every day with her obviously we had to take shifts because everyone else because everyone else wanted to spend time with her too but there were times when I would see her at least once a day very special. 
very, very special indeed. Malcolm, I will do my best to find your feline wonder. We we'll always drive very slowly. Yesterday, she was so camouflaged, she could almost drive over if you're not careful. Obviously, she would move beforehand, but um, you don't want to influence the cats in any way. So we're looking for some shade, looking for a spot. This is right where we left her. She was right here on the right-hand side. There is, I'm not going to get out and grab the pieces. I can see the draw of the deck. I don't know if you can see it, Craig. Eh? I don't want to get out lest she's here somewhere. First gonna do a little scratch around here before. You can just see a little bit. Sorry, the car's in the way. There's the leg. Well, it looks like Ralph Kirsten has been far luckier than myself. It is the Duke himself. Hello, mister. And he's coming straight up towards us. A lovely little bit of marking. Now, he might walk straight past us on the side here. Hello, mister. There we go. And he's going to shift slowly past the back of us. And just as soon as I've got enough space that I'm not going to irritate him, I'm going to turn around. I might just go forward a little bit and then turn, but we are in luck. i just got to let go. Thanks everyone, celebrating, so am I. So we're just going to keep eyes on him there. It's a little bit tight here in this drainage line, just to turn, but uh, nothing, never fear. Land Rover will do it, and Darby, we don't get stuck now. Okay, a little bit of work here in the sandy bank. Don't worry, it's a bit tight, but we'll do it. There we go, there we go. And out we go. And here the squirrels now all go <laughs> crazy as uh, Tingana walks along. He's now heading on to Gauri Main. So this was, uh, he came along Gauri Main, um, headed into this little block here towards Chitwa, Chitwa um, Dam. Asping. Lovely. He's on a little bit of a territorial loop, I think. And up the main road. I'm just going to respond here. Ralph standing by. I'm, I'm with Tingana. He's now just come out of the Mlualnini and he's uh, heading on Gauri Main um, in an easterly direction. Alrighty. Oops. Sorry, Davi. Okay, sorry everyone, there is a little bit of gremlins here. We are deep down inside a drainage line. So that's the reason why I wanted to just get a little bit closer while we watch Tingana probably go for a poo and, uh, and then he'll continue on. He has had a little bit of marking sessions and when we saw him the other day, he was um, nice and full. He had a little bit of blood on his neck. When was that? Yesterday morning. Gee, sometimes these days all morph into one. He didn't seem to have too much of a poo there. Uh, he did seem to try. But uh, now the squirrels are all starting to go ballistic around us. Uh, but let's, uh, let's catch up with him before he disappears. Wonderful. See what I mean? Always expect the unexpected. 
We came out with no real intentions. We just thought we'd come and see whatever we find. And I actually said to Darvi a little bit earlier, because uh, this morning I was following tracks, following tracks, following tracks, and um, I didn't find anything. Now, I was chasing my tail the whole morning, and uh, this afternoon I said, I'm not finding any tracks. Put me off. I'm just going to be looking. And we found a nice bull elephant in must. And now, surprise, surprise, the Duke. We are just coming up slowly behind him. I don't want to press up too close. Just give him the space. It's a nice incline here that he's going up. And uh, just check my map. Just to see. I hope he... Now, Adele, um, this is one of the reasons why I love what I do. Some days can be slightly frustrating, but you know what? I don't need to sit in traffic. I don't need to um, have the daily grind, you know. Um, so this is uh, its absolutely amazing. And thank you to all the viewers for allowing me to bring this to you because it's because of you that I'm sitting here right now with the Duke. And it's great that I'm able to show you as well. And so that's why I just keep on doing what I do and I do it with a smile. Look at that beautiful dewlap on him. And he looks like he might be sort of half interested in whatever might be around, whether it's other leopards or antelope or something that he might potentially chase down. He's looking in a little bit of a boisterous mood. So all we can do is just keep following. And I'll just wait for him to shift now, and then I'll go up behind him. Beautiful kitty cat. There he goes. Now, child of the universe, I don't know if Tingana having mated with any females recently. Um, it's only Hukumuri that is, has been mating, well, that we know of, that has been mating with Shudulu. But um, uh, Ting could have, without us knowing, that's always a possibility. Um, but here he is, look at doing that typical rubbing, and then, and then after that, then he does his little spray. So I love watching them when they go on their hind legs and lift up like that with their head into the branches. It, it always makes me think they're being really playful. But uh, obviously it's just part of their, their marking routine. Now, I don't know what road this is that I can direct guys in to follow us. It's not always such a bad thing. If they're coming and they're saying, where are you? And I say, well, I don't know, but we're sitting with Tingana. Um, but I, I'll tell them it's that road just um, east of the Mlalmini. So let me just let everybody else know. Uh, stations are also from Wild Earth. Tungana has left the road again. Um, and he's headed into the block. Uh, he headed just up the hill from the Mualmini in an easterly direction. Uh, and then he turned right onto that first road. I don't know what it's called. With the power line. Um, and then he's uh, headed into the easterly block. I'm following up behind him. So you guys can I'll always direct you in. He's going to that termite mound. Let's hope that he goes up on top. Oh, there he is already. Fish, that was fast. Uh, Romit, uh, the longest distance that I've ever followed a leopard for was in Namibia, and it was probably close on 100 kilometers, Romit, um, but a little bit different landscape to what we have here. I would say here in the low felt, uh, or this particular area, the longest I've followed um, a leopard was probably on Solati Game Reserve. There we are. And um, it looks like he might be watching something. Has he spotted something? Beautiful on top of the termite mound there. We'll just um, we'll let him settle, and if he stays, I'll obviously try and get us a better view. I just want to see if he's maybe spotted something from there. 
because he's got a nice vantage point and he does look like he's looking but um, here in the low felt I would say probably uh, over about 15,000 hectares is the longest I've followed a leopard um, but that was with students and um, uh, we we had the the possibility of just continuing following for the you know we we actually followed him for two and a half days, so yeah we pretty much almost crossed the entire game reserve, so that was very very interesting as well to follow a leopard on its very nomadic pathway as it just shifted around the reserve on its own. Now Kiwi, who's a new viewer, thanks once again for your um, uh, question. It's great to have you guys involved with us and uh, a part of this uh, as it's happening, you know, live right now. Um, the leopards and lions don't particularly think of humans as food. We haven't uh, traditionally um, or historically been food for predators like that. It's only sick and, and sort of um, uh, injured or old animals that might potentially start thinking of us as prey. Uh, in general, um, you know, they see us as another apex predator, and so they possibly think of us as competition, but not generally as food. I mean, I'm pretty sure that if I sat here with an open wound dripping with blood, um, it could potentially attract them. I know the hyenas would be the first to probably respond to that. Um, and, and the lions and leopards could eventually as well, because they could see an opportunity. But they're not generally uh, looking at humans as food. Um, you know, historically and evolution-wise, they do focus on the on the true animals that they've hunted over thousands of years, and humans never really fallen in that category. So I think they've just instinctively realised that um, humans are dangerous, and they're more wary of us than uh, think of us as food. Now he has settled a little bit, so I think I might just go a little bit around like that, so we can maybe get a beautiful view on his face. What do you think of that? Nice and slowly, and he's right up on top of that termite now, so I think it might be perfect for us. I'm sorry, there are some branches and things that just rub up against the side of the vehicle. We are in the thick of it, so that's why you might just hear a bit of scratching going on. But these vehicles are made exactly for that. And I'll just maybe put my nose in here a little bit. How's that? So that we don't block his view, but that we can see his face. That's it. And it's about a half an hour or so away from that, you know, that golden hour. So here he is sitting on top of a termite mound and just scanning the area. Now, Tabojo, sometimes leopard can stay up in trees and spot for animals, um, but they do need to move around their territory, not only for uh, sort of keeping other would-be competitors out, um, but also to literally hunt down the prey. So they'll, they'll move into an area where they can then lie in ambush or they can stalk up on the prey. and. I mean, the chances are eventually, if they had to lie up in a tree, um, that something eventually would come underneath them and they could jump down and, and catch it or see some prey from up there. And I can actually see some impala moving in front. I think that might be what he was watching. They're just moving through the thickets up there. And I'm pretty sure if you just go to the right, they're disappearing in the thickets there, but that's definitely what he's been watching. That's what he had his eye on as soon as he went up. Uh, it was just quite fleeting, so sorry about that. But there was a ram impala that I saw just cross over there. And now Tingana's put his head down for a little snooze, it looks like. But uh, I think we'll stay right here and not go anywhere because uh, it's perfect timing that we found him. Maybe we'll see him go down for a drink a little bit closer to sunset. And we can spend some time with the Duke. What better way to spend your afternoon, hey? And we'll leave the other guides to go and find some other things and keep the show uh, variable. But for our part, I think, what do you guys think? I think I'm going to be hanging with Tingana for the rest of the drive. 
But you can tell me if you want me to go somewhere else, but you'll have to vote for it, I think, because I think uh, mostly uh, people will say that I should be hanging with this guy. If I'm the deciding vote, I'm saying we stay, but uh, you guys can decide for yourselves. Uh, Christoph, you're saying that uh, Tingana seems to be more noble, um, and uh, well, then Hukumuri. Well, that I suppose uh, definitely comes down to him being quite a bit older, and you know, you're saying also elegant. Um, well, absolutely, but uh, you know, sometimes that does come with age. Hukumuri a lot younger than him, and so he's got that youthful exuberance about him, and you know. Uh, youthful energy as well and I think Hukumuri hasn't quite filled out as well just yet he does still have that slight look of a youngster um, especially in his shoulders and in his body his head is very big which shows that he is going to be a, a very very good looking cat but I think he's got a little bit of filling out to do and um, well I think they're both uh, very very amazing cats in their own rights um, the Duke obviously having been around a lot longer, uh, but Hukumuri as an upcomer, uh, I think is, is uh, just, as, just as special, uh, but unique in his own way. Okay, so it seems like it's a done deal. You guys think I'm staying with him? Well, you were going to have to convince me otherwise because uh, I was uh, just asking. But uh, as I say, if I did have the deciding vote, I would, uh, I would veto the rest. But uh, we always want to know what everyone thinks. And sometimes it can get, you know, not boring, but a little bit frustrating maybe, just sitting with a cat that's sleeping. But, well, we can talk about all sorts of things. We can debate on different matters like we have started to do about Hukumuri, Tingana, and Shudulu, and, you know. And we might not see Tingana for the next week. So it's always good just to hang around. And we might have a, a, another vehicle or two coming in now. So, just so that you understand that there might be a bit of noise from the vehicles. Yeah, you can make your way, yeah? Uh, here they come. Annie, I think he might be a little bit hungry because of the way that he was looking at those Impala. But yesterday morning, he had a very fat belly and um, he also had a little bit of blood on his neck. So I think he he's not starving, that's for sure. But, um, uh, well, you never know with leopards. They could uh, take a chance whenever they like. But as I say, I think he has fed recently. So I wouldn't put it past him if he actually just wants to sleep, relax, maybe drink some water. And he'll always have a look at prey if they're around. But um, doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to hunt. Some of the other guys coming in now. And I say, I think we'll just wait a little bit and see if he shifts his position. Otherwise, I'll, I'll try and get a view from the other side. It's always tricky because, you know, to get the light right and uh, to get the sort of him facing towards you, you know, that's one of the skills that you always need to work with as a guide because um, we're always trying to get the guests into the perfect position to get the photograph, etc. But sometimes you go around that side and he'll turn around and roll over this way and then, you know, you've sort of irritated everybody and so on. So sometimes good just to wait a little while and see what he does. Maybe we get the light right. Or you go around that side and um, you then get a shot on his face, but then you're facing straight into the sun. So there's a, there's a few things that you need to play with. I just like to first get into a good position and then sit and wait for a while, and then we can always shift as we see fit. Okay, I think I am definitely now. It looks like he's going to go for a little snooze. So I might try to just get a, a better view of his, of his face because uh, it would be nice to see him in his, in his full glory. Well, while I reposition, off to Rafiki Dave. Fantastic news of Tingana. Yay, that's good news. But now we were told earlier the 
Du kommst mit auf Benzin her, alle in der Afternoon. And that's what we're trying to trace and find out whether they're here or not here. But at least it's good that you have one cut and you're trying to find out where the Nukuhumas are. So we wanted to scan around this area and see if you're going to see them. But this is where they were last seen. Anywhere around here. So let's just look carefully. Robert, that's a great question. What's my favorite lion pride? And having seen the sticks today, I think I would choose the Nukumas. The sticks may be just a bit of a concern of the, sorry there, sorry there, uh, of the main situation they had. I would think I would go for the Nukumas. So of those two prides, I think the Nukumas could be my favorite ones for now. I haven't seen any other set of any other type of, any other any other third or fourth pride, but for those two the sticks and the Nukuhumas, I think Nukuhumas from it are my favorite ones. As we look for them, so Romet, keep your eyes open and we look for them together. All right, Steve got a spotted tall animal. <laughs> we do. We've got a very nice big male giraffe. He's got a very big bump on his forehead. Let's see when he pops up. Look at that. There it is. Now, as male giraffes get older, they get more calcifications and sort of ex uh, increases, which, well, calcifications on their head, which sort of increases the strength of the head or the weight of the head. And you can see those ossicones. Ossicones are the horns on top of the head. Are very very thick which tells you it's a male the reason why they need their head to get sort of heavier and thicker with more weight is that they swing it around when they fight he's not fighting right now he's busy enjoying some leaves of the red bush willow i wonder if he knows if you make a lovely decoction out of them they can serve and to help any abdominal pain giraffe girl yes we got another giraffe for you was there one done this morning then i wasn't watching the show but marvelous nice big male enjoying it looks like the red bush willow to me oh david had one drinking ah yes i was trying to find some cheetah at the time so marvelous we just heard him again i don't know if you heard that but he flapped his ears and it made this very flappy sound i've never heard a giraffe flap its ears before i've seen them flap them i've never heard the noise and there we all thought giraffes were mute see how far down he's able to reach to feed superbike so a giraffe is the tallest land mammal and five and a half meters about 18 feet and they get up to about 1,500 kilograms. So double that equivalently, about 3,000 or so pounds. He's gonna move out of shot there as they do. But that is a very big example of a male that the weights and size I just gave you. And this is a guy probably on that sort of wavelength. So go back, oh, we're going to lose him there, aren't we? You can hear the characteristic sort of um, ox peckers on his back as he has probably come from a drink himself at Bivalzook Dam, because we are almost there. Um, we tried to follow up on any signs of Tandi, and um, we found the remains of that, that they could kill, and there was nothing left but a jawbone and some fur, and that kill was here. And then I, I got off a bit and had a bit of a scratch around, and I found Tandi scats about 60 meters about that, w that way. And so just the general direction of that, because I know she's going to want to go drink. So let me show you on the map, because it's quite a tricky thing. Because where we were is right over there in the middle of my finger. And so if, if you know anything about this map, you've seen it before. It is equidistant. If Craig goes up just a little bit, there we go. It's equidistant to Chelapan, Bivalzook Watering Hole, and Vuitella Dam. So... I figured because her scat was 60 meters in that direction, we're going to kind of have a scratch around at Bivosuk Dam and see if maybe they've come this way. If not, well, 
no doubt we'll have a little hippo and we'll have all sorts of other things to see. And then failing that, we will go and have a look at the other two watering holes because this time of day, it is going to start becoming time for these animals to start moving. As uh, Ralph is showing you with the old Duke Tingana patrolling Torchwood, the old devil. Isn't it marvelous to find him? I was hoping, sort of inwardly, driving along on our way to Tundi, we would just see him. Because the road we took is the kind of the road he's been he's been on the last last week or so. It's kind of where we've seen him. So just hoping there he is. Maybe he's going to pop out. But he's moving some nice some nice distance. No doubt in his territorial wanderings. Also looking for some food, no doubt. Sean, indeed, Tandi is the queen of Juma. Um, she's got really good territory here, but uh, there was a bit of a, an encounter between her and the young Shadulu female. Now, Shadulu is four or so, maybe five, and Tandi is about 12. So, you know, the young cat is probably going to have more strength than her. Tandi has got the girl and the strength to compete. So I'm losing signal again, and I'm just going to quickly finish that off. So yes, Tandi is the queen of Juma, but she seems to, if we go back onto the, the map over here, just like the old Duke has done, the old Duke seems to be keeping to this area over here. He's now over here in Torchwood. Tandi is always over here. This is kind of where she's at, um, even though Rexon had some tracks over here by the dam the other day, where Shadulu is coming in sort of this sort of area. Um, and Shadow used to sort of be in this sort of area here. We haven't seen her in some months. And that is it for, for the female leopards that I've really spent time with in the last while. But Yotani would be the most prominent feature. She's definitely the most, she's the favorite for most people because of that little bundle of joy that she has. But uh, we are losing a little bit of signal in this depression. We're going to go back over to Ralph with the Duke of Juma himself. Well, look at this everybody. I've just repositioned and this light is beautiful now with Tingana. You see what I mean? Just a slight reposition, just a different angle and we get this beautiful light coming in onto Tingana. So, and we're the only ones here for the time being, but that won't remain as such because obviously Tingana being as famous as he is, um, there will be other people that want to come and have a look. So I mean, just enjoy our time alone with him right now um, before some other vehicles do arrive. And I always like it the most when I'm alone, uh, especially with a beautiful cat like this. They're solitary animals and uh, I almost like to respect them in the way that uh, I'm sitting with them alone. We still do obviously only allow three vehicles onto any kind of sighting um, and sometimes less in more sensitive uh, environments um, such as like if there's a, a cheetah with cubs or you know um, a leopard with cubs uh, it's then normally a one or two vehicle sighting um, but obviously a cat like this that is very habituated to vehicles, um, it's one of the reasons why people do come to these areas. So very important that we bring everybody in, obviously still maintaining the ethics, ethics and standards. Um, but like I've chatted before, if it pays, it stays. And I can tell you that Tingana has probably paid for a lot of the conservation that goes on in this particular area just by merely having people here taking photos and they come back year after year um, because of beautiful cats like this. And Tingana obviously being one of the stars of this area, Torchwood, Chitwa Chitwa, Juma, um, very important that uh, we make that available for people to come and see. And there's uh, one of the vehicles start to come in. Now, Kiwi, and that's just some of the birds that are bumping up there. Um, leopards are solitary cats like the rest of your cats around the world. So, it, it, you know, and I'm not, I'm not um, 
uh, you know, pushing the question back to you uh, in, in any other way except by saying, why aren't lions solitary? That's more the question because normal cat behavior is to be solitary. So the only gregarious or sociable cats are lions and then cheetahs to a certain degree. But the rest of the cats around the world are all solitary animals except when they've got cubs or when they are mating. So that's the normal behavior of cats. Lions go against the grain and they're the only ones that are so sociable. So that's very interesting from that side. And obviously using that as a tactic to be able to bring down big prey um, and being your mega carnivores. Hello everyone. Hello Peter. So there we go. And you see Tingana there just looking over towards us. He's always got that curious look. I love it when he puts his ears out like that. Now, I am Brain. You're, you're wondering if Hukumuri uh, uh, Tingana has hunted um, warthogs like Hukumuri does. I haven't seen him doing that, but I'm pretty sure that you could, uh, the viewers would probably be, uh, the long time viewers would be, um, uh, have all sorts of um, different uh, encounters of him, and I, I would guarantee that he's at least killed a few warthogs in his life. Uh, and it wouldn't only be limited to Impala, he's probably taken on some young Kudu, Nyala, uh, Impala, uh, warthogs. Um, and you know a number of other things, Dacre, Steenbok, and all sorts. But uh, as I say, I haven't seen him eating any warthog. Only in parlor I have, but I'm still new to the area, so absolutely beautiful the termite mound that he's sitting on. Just makes for a perfect, ideal setting with the green thorn here in front as well. just as if he knows that we want to photograph and video him and he's sitting up in the perfect spot. Now inquiring mind with um, Tingana having mated with his daughter Tandi, obviously that's not ideal. That's not ideal um, and uh, you, you would prefer to have uh, you know, someone like Hukumuri coming in and, you know, at least shifting him into an area that he wouldn't be uh, mating with his daughter. So you are going to eventually pick up problems with that uh, kind of um, a mixing of genes or lack thereof. Uh, you would prefer um, as diverse mix of genes as possible. So that's why it's, it's actually better if a male that is born uh, to a female gets shifted uh, to a totally different area. Um, by other males that are territory, territory wise, um, you know, very active and, and very uh, competitive in a specific area. So, for whatever reason, he hasn't been pushed out, and then that does land up, you know, where you can get these kind of problems. And, and if that continues, you know, the fathers mating with daughters, uh, brothers and sisters, etc., you're obviously going to land up with deficiencies in the, in the cats themselves. Um, and uh, eventually that, that kind of breeding does, does take its toll. Um, maybe on the first line it might not particularly show through, but you could also have it coming through you know, a couple of generations later, for instance. So no, it's not an ideal situation and that, uh, that's obviously unfortunate. But it does happen um, naturally as well. It's uh, just the circumstances that sometimes uh, prevail. And that's about it. Oh, he's up. There you're off to. Ah, no, I think yes, you might be absolutely right there. I'm just uh, watching him as he goes past one of the trackers. And we'll just see exactly how he goes. He's heading in the direction where those Impala were. So I might just spin around and maybe make a follow. Let's keep up with the old boy. So 
as I said, there's three of us in here now. We'll all just give each other space and give each other right of way at different times. We, we work as part of a team and we also get the rewards as part of a team. You know, I might today be the one that finds three leopards um, and then I share that with the other guys and on other days I might find nothing and then they're sharing it with me. So, you know, it's very important that we, do, we all share these kind of encounters. The one thing that we do need to be careful of, however, is just moving from sighting to sighting without actually actively going and looking for some sightings of your own because, um, you know, you, you sometimes get those guys that are just listening listening to the radio um, and if you've got three vehicles on a sighting okay so now you also want to come and have a look but instead of just sitting down the road and waiting for your turn go and have a look in the area you might find another leopard so that's that's important I think to remember always as a, as a guide and obviously I've been head ranger on a couple of reserves and uh, and managing of these guides as well um, and that's obviously one of my major big things is that guys standing in line just waiting to come in on a sighting um, they need to go and do a bit of work on their own as well but that's just a little bit of you know insight into the life of a guide and what some guides do what some guides don't do but there's no perfect way in doing it it's just a, I would say some some ways are better than others Okay, so let's, uh, let's get ahead of Tingana here and just see if we can watch him nicely. But um, Rafiki Dave, how's your afternoon going? My afternoon is going well and very nice to know that Tingana is on the move. And maybe his move might be some fruit later, who knows. We are on this waterhole here just looking whether we could get something interesting, but nice work there by Fag of Camera Work, seeing the trees upside down in the water, and some blacksmith lapwing feeding on the edge of the water. Initially, when you got here, we had seen some terrapins, and they sneaked back in the water, but at least you got the blacksmith lapwings, which are not very skittish, and how nice to see the action moving and jumping in the water, grabbing some insects or kind of a shrimp or any insect that could be floating there. But you notice they don't get in the water very much like other water birds, you know. They'll just be feeding on the edge of the water. That's very characteristic for most lapwings, unlike the bigger, say, herons or stocks that be right or egrets right inside the water feeding. These ones tend to feed on the edge of the water. Blacksmith lapwing there, always being in pairs. And the other one, I'm sure, is not very far from this one here. Sometimes they go in the water and they spook out the terrapins. Keeps moving and feeding. And yeah, we shall just now continue with our search. We did not see the Nukumus. They must have hidden themselves somewhere or they thought they don't want to, you know, take more photographs. And I thought, I had seen some sticks. The stick pried this morning. Maybe we're gonna swing by there and find out if they're where I left them. And let's find out if we're gonna get them where they were. Okay, sorry, fuck. Okay, let's just move on and let the blacksmith lapwing enjoy itself. And now we are heading to the stick sprite where I saw them in the morning. Chances are they could be where they are. I do not think they might have moved because they had eaten a lot. I think they had a huge uh, water bath last night and there was some water pump not, from, not far from where they are. So chances are they'd be just hanging around that area. It should be exciting. I'll be seeing them for the second time and maybe have a closer look on them and try and understand the condition they have been going through of uh, the scapotic mange, which I don't think the Nukuhumas have had that one or they have ever had. But it's very interesting to look lions which are pulling through such an infection. And as I said earlier, from what I gathered from my colleagues, they looked rather bad a few months ago and for them to be where they are 
chances are they'll make it, which will be very good news. Very good news. For sure, you're asking if a lion is kicked out of a group, can it join another group? Uh, yes and no, it depends on how it's kicked out. But you notice the males, when they form their coalition and they swing by uh, the prey of lions and they notice the boys are getting big and they're trying to show, you know, any sexual maturity uh, characteristics in them, the males will always show them the door. And chances are they'll always go out and form a coalition. It's very difficult to see, for example, one lioness on its own. And also it's very difficult for the lionesses to kick out another lioness, unless for, I don't know what reasons. So that rarely happens. But once the males are kicked out of the pride, as they get big and they're told, you know, go live your life, go get new friends to live with, they'll always go and hang out with other males and they have you know a new beginning for their lives yeah they'll definitely get some people to hang out with and very difficult to see them living on their own leopards are the only cats once you know they have matured go go you on your own so lions very social cats very social I am brain, anything three to four years, young males are able to be independent and they can live their own life. But by the time they are getting to seven, eight years old, those are very mature males and they could easily, in the coalition, be quite in charge. You really have some dominance when you look at males. Of course, some males will look bigger than others. Some males will have bigger manes than others. But unlike, you know, other animals where you'll have dominant, uh, sorry, just bumped, so, some uh, water bucks there, it's very unusual for the lions to have, say, a dominant male or one that's not. And that's water buck running there, are two of them. There's two girls. And these are the common water bucks. And I think we lost one of them to the stick spread of lions yesterday. When the numbers are still doing good, the Nukuhumas had a couple of uh, warthogs. So let's keep moving forward as we head to the sticks. And hopefully, maybe they might bring another water back down. Who knows? It's a bigger pride, I think, than the Nukuhumas. I think they're 13, and the Nukuhumas are 11. Water bucks always very close to water, and as the name implies, they drink lots of water and they'll always not stay very far from water ponds or from water holes or rivers or lakes. We've got two types of water bucks, the common water bucks, and we also got another type that's called the defasa water buck. And the differences is always, uh, fuck, keep moving forward a little bit. Is that good there? Okay. So if you can catch that, I'm gonna show you, sorry, you look on the, uh, Bumps there, they have that characteristic white ring. People have always said they look like you might have sat on a wet toilet. And it's a big male in front, they're moving. So these are the common water bucks. And the other type is the defasa water buck, which have totally white rump instead of that ring you see on the back there. Could be a male and a couple of females. Heading maybe for a drink somewhere. Fantastic. And maybe Steve has another surprise for us. Well, look at what we have found, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I'd be lying if I said I found it. But remember, we spoke about checking the three watering holes, Bufusuk, Vuyatela, and Chelapan. Well, Rexon went to check Vuyatela, and uh, he heard alarm calls, and he found Tandi. Tlalamba is here somewhere as well, but at the moment, we can't see her. Tandi is busy with another Dacre kill, 
The seemingly dake is all over the place in Juma. She's eating them one at a time. Very, very effective mother, this. I wonder if Columba has eaten enough of the last dake kill. is not that hungry, because she hasn't quite revealed herself. But there she is. That's the look. That's the Tandy we all know and love. So we're just sort of east of Voyatella watering hole in the thickets here and would be impossible to have found her without listening to the characteristic alarm calls he heard some franklin just like i did last night he heard the franklin alarm calling and they don't lie what a sunday it is indeed tandy That's quite a nice distance she's traveled, but no doubt they came down to Voyatella Dam to drink, or alternatively to Tamburti Dam, which is just north or just east of northeast of the firebreak, the cut line up in Bufusuk. She could have either gone there or to um Voyatella. It's really hard to say. But I've no doubt that they definitely drank. And then, you know, as Tanya does, a snack on another daker, as you do. Fantastic. Can you imagine trying to find that, folks, in the long grass? Beachman Blessings, your favorite cat, indeed. My favorite cat is Hosanna, who we see is down in the Singita Londolozi area. It's predicted he'd probably move away to go and wow some other people with his antics. But Tandy's here to stay, and uh, characteristically, a young cub, a female cub like Columba, would also stay in the area. Her mom would just carve out a piece of her territory. But as we do know, males are supposed to leave. That's what the books say. Maybe Tingana finally gave him a slap around the ears and he moved off. And Kiki, oh, it would have been really nice to see her taking down the daker. But in the vegetation we're in now, I doubt we would have seen anything. If we'd been with her, Maybe it would be possible to see her moving and then to see her feeding. But um, to physically see her take it down. I mean, Craig and I the other day with Uncle Uma is in a very open area and we still miss the takedown shot. It's very, very hard in this environment. Very, very hard. It's just another vehicle coming in to join us there. We're very excited to see a leopard. Superbike's no idea where Shadulu is. She um, is probably in the west, in Simbambili. Or she could be on an Impala kill just in Sandy Patch. Um, I wasn't out this morning, but there was no reports of her tracks. But uh, we know where Tandi is now. She's come all the way to just north of Uyatela Dam, exactly kind of where I was pointing to earlier. If we go quickly back to the map, we're just over here. We are, where are we? We're over here. So it's actually very likely that she went up to this dam up here, Tabuti, from her last place. She did maybe a loop through like that. Who knows? Who knows what they did? But this kind of seems to be where she hangs out now and should do more sort of on that side. But very interesting dynamics indeed. Where is the little playful one? David, invariably leopards, when they meet each other, male or female, will rather posture and dominate the other one through submissive behavior or through being dominant. So what Hosanna does when he sees an adult is he just behaves like a youngster and then they invariably leave him alone. So a dominant female will call a um, scent mark and that invariably keeps them separated. But when it does come down to a bit of a turf war and they do encounter each other, there can be growling, there can be snarling, they won't look at each other. They'll kind of like sits on opposite ends of an imaginary line, a line that they know very, very well. And um, But if, for example, Shadulu moving in is trying to claim a piece of that land, then um, it could lead to quite a, a ferocious battle. But neither leopard wants to fight to the death, neither of them wants to get into too much of a confrontation which could lead to them losing 
condition and health and essentially dying. So while we stay with Tandy, I believe the Duke is on the move. As soon as he disappears. Okay, everyone here. Um, Tingana is on the move, so it's keeping us very busy trying to keep up with him. But uh, we'll just keep trying our best just to move with him as he goes along through the thickets here. Just keep a little bit of a distance, just not to disturb him too much, you know. Um, but we are right on his tail. So, just uh, keeping up with him. And sometimes you just want to flank him a little bit just to see. It looks like he may be interested in a little bit of a hunt. Not sure. But he's had a little couple of interest interesting looks at some animals um, but he hasn't committed anything yet so we're just going around catching up and it's always just a bit of um, cat and mouse really with us being the cat and Tingana being the mouse and we're following him around here in the thickets but it's always fun I enjoy this kind of following behind the cat especially now I don't know if he's out on the road yes he is so he's still just slowly walking along doing a little bit of marking and now he's moving a little bit further south into Chitwa so he's moved quite a big distance um, from yesterday where he was literally at Voyatella Dam have you got him there? There he is moving through now just moving through slowly he's gone into this thicket here so we need to find a way in hang on but we need to box me in here Okay, so we're just carrying on, keeping up behind him, just uh, going to try and get him when he's sitting nicely, and then that's obviously the ultimate goal when we can relax with him. Um, but uh, while we wait for him or see what he's going to do, let's head you on back over to Steve. We haven't missed anything, folks. The lumber hasn't come out yet. Tundi's still gnawing away at her. What Rexon tells me is a day could kill. I haven't actually seen it. Every now and again, she looks back behind her shoulder. That's probably where Columba is somewhere. Over there, no doubt, in the next little while, she's probably starting to start calling from her. So as it starts getting darker, we know it becomes quite tricky for these cats. That's when the hyenas start moving. The little rebellious rascal mustn't go too far away from the watchful eye of mum. Otherwise, she could land herself in trouble. So if this is the best view we're going to be able to get for you without disrupting. But how well does that camouflage work? as the season gets drier and drier. But what is good news is there's still lots and lots of vegetation around into June. We've had a lot of grass this year. It's going to be quite good for the zebra population, which will then facilitate the wildebeest and the buffalo also. They enjoy nice tall, long grass like this. You can think of it as like sort of a winter reserve. You can hear her crunching those bones. Mm. He's enjoying all the goodness, crunching the bones to get the marrow out. And Dacre being a pretty small animal, the bones would be pretty soft for an adult leopard.
Always a little bit of feeding and then head up to listen. Feeding and listen. You might hear the characteristic sound of a machine gun photographic photography happening off to the side. And we do have some very fancy cameras taking pictures of this very well photographed leopardess. I suppose all queens come with their paparazzi. Almost feels like you part of the scene with us here, folks. So we're just hoping that that little naughty youngster is going to pop out on the scene anytime soon. Come and steal that meat from mum. She did last week with Ralph. It was quite something to see. Watching her run away with the meat last night was quite comical. But again, they find themselves in an area with not too much in the way of sort of cover, if it means climbing up a tree. So if it starts getting dark, we will move out of this area. There's no real safety net. Just a lot of small trees around here, yeah, little... Um, silver cluster leaves which don't offer too much in the way of climbing potential. Leopard would be able to get up there but wouldn't be able to stay for too long. You might have just got the glimpse of a group of guests there enjoying this leopard wild in the African wilderness. Karen, that's a very good question. As we arrived in the sighting, I have a very strong feeling that we might have driven over some of Tundi's poo. Um, there's a very characteristic smell of leopard scat. Lion scat smells very similar. It's a deathly decaying meaty sort of smell. And um, that was the first whiff we got on entering the scene. So yes, that's what we can smell. Other than that, we can't smell too much from that dacre. The dacre would be very fresh, so there wouldn't be any sort of decomposition happening with it as of yet. Take a few days for that to start smelling, but hyena have got a very, very good sense of smell, and they'll quickly be able to pick up the, the blood in the air. They do cover such a vast distance that any sort of movement of air around will pick up the sm slightest trace of blood in the air and on inward they'd come and also very good sense of hearing they could even hear the bones crunching i'd say from some distance i know all the viewers are hoping columba is going to emerge and come and play with her mum as she does. Probably lead to a little bit of grooming. No doubt a little bit of boisterous play. You can see how those ears are always cocked, always listening. I am brain, yes, most certainly. Both male and female leopards will mark their territory. Very similar strategy, and the, the purpose of the territory marking is not only to demarcate against other females, but also to advertise to males. Uh, you'll see male leopards will stick their faces in and their, their noses into the urine, and uh, they will test it and test the Jacobson organ with that phlegm and grimace, which will then allow for... Um, them to realize if this female is an estrus where exactly she's at 
what's going on with her. And then he'll probably follow her. See if he can get a, um, if he can catch her before she finds another male. That is the way it works. Invariably got about three females in the territory of one male. Oh, her head's up again. Sorry, Craig. She finally put her head up. There she is. Ah, oh, she's moved. <laughs> Sorry about that. So you invariably get about three females within the territory of one male. Obviously, it's quite loose. It's not as sort of, sort of, the, the demarcations aren't as set as a lot of people would make out. You see, there's lots of crossing over that happens. But uh, what that does is leads to a bit of confusion because females can often come into East just at similar times and there's no way that that one male would be able to service all three of the females in his territory, which means that other males will come in. And so there can be a huge amount of confusion in sort of the population with his, with lions as well regarding like who are the parents? Who is the dad? Who is the father? But leopard territories really does interest me and what I'm seeing here in the Sabi Sands is, is dry, is really, 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 really interesting. I'm just going to speak to someone coming in here so they get the best position. Warren for Steve. Now, if you just pull your nose right in there, that's probably the best place. That's where Rexon was. Uh, she's just under the bush over here. That's probably your best view. Just got to, important with the radar to guide people in so they park in the right spot. Um, obviously, if they don't know where the cat is, they might drive directly into the path. Um, and that, you know, you need to just obviously watch for that. Okay, I think they've got her. There we go. Mmm. Okay, Corin, I don't know exactly how far into Torchwood... Um, I'm going to have a little look on my map and see if I can work out sort of a, a, a distance for you. But I'd, I'd say it's probably between two and maybe three kilometers, so maybe a mile and a half. Um, he's walking on, along the Millville Nini drainage, uh, which will invariably come back to to the Milwati, Milwati drainage system, which will take him back to um, Muetela Dam. So seems to be they like those sort of drainage systems they walk through that's where we've seen the old duke constantly the last little while uh, even hukumuri when i followed the other day and i was talking with craig about that last night that following those drainage systems is so important for us to pick up on these animals because there's daika there there's nyala uh the giraffe not that they're looking for giraffe but the giraffe are feeding so lions will be moving into those areas the warthog, that's exactly where the Ngulm has killed the warthog yesterday. Chelapan is just next to the drainage, and because it's sort of down a slope, those areas are invariably where the muddy wallows will be formed, and so there's more vegetation. You might not see water in the river system, but if there is deep, sort of subcutaneous deep water, uh, that's what gives leaves to the trees. A very, very good area for, for the herbivores. So that's why you see leopards and lions moving through those areas. Very, very important habitat. Without the drainage system, this whole area would be a very, very different sort of system. So we're probably going to stay here a little while longer until the little slumber materializes. And we really, really, really hope that she does. I've come back to where I saw the sticks early this morning and also a chance if they are still there and um, in that particular location now and assuming they were fully fed I think I'm getting so close I can see some of our friends there so I think they're still here they have not gone anywhere I saw a camera flash somewhere in the air so most likely they're here just hold on and see if we'll get to you to the sticks yes they're still here they haven't gone nowhere So Fag will be getting me the best location. Yeah, I think we're good to go. I can see only one vehicle because what we do here, 
will always have maximum of three vehicles at a sighting. So it's only one. So we'll try to get as close as possible and as quietly as possible. We'll brush a few, you know, brushes here, which is fine. Nothing to worry. And in maybe in another 40 seconds to be there. Just keep holding on. Are you good, Frank? And this is where the sticks are. And they're still here. I can see them. So let me get the best position for you. Where's that fuck you going? Let me know when to stop. All right. And there we are with the sticks, right? And you can see there are so very many sticks on the foreground. And our friends are moving forward a little bit, so we might have a chance to move forward a little bit. There they are. Same place they left them in the morning. And as I said, because they were very well fed, they had no reason to go anywhere. Look at that framing of the sticks there. And that youngster was very busy also today licking itself. I doubt this is about what they ate last night. My feeling is the condition they've been going through of uh, scapotic mange which I think they have recovered and come through very well. Hello. How are you? You're going to recover. You should be fine. Very str strange when you imagine how cats will get, you know, mange, you know, including leopards and uh, cheetahs. But also there's a possibility they would get it even from the animals they bring down. I'm talking of, you know, even small animals like uh, buffaloes. You know, buffaloes will have mange, and when the lions will hunt buffaloes, they could easily get, you know, the mites from them as they're feeding on the buffaloes. Yeah, should we move and see if All right. So let's see. reposition and give you a better spot. Fantastic. The way to go. That's very good. And I'm equally excited. And Fabio, let me know when to stop. Okay, and you notice here they have young cubs. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's the way to go. And I can also tell this one should definitely make it. If you see the one on the neck, you can see like dark spots behind the ear on the one licking itself, and that's a clear sign of mange. I do not know how they looked maybe a few months ago, but depending on the animal, normally. The infection will start around the ears, the eyes, and the neck, and then moving backwards. That's where the infection will start. And as I was saying earlier, lions may not interact, but if one of them gets it, definitely the rest of them will, you know, get infected. Because the lions are very touchy, they're very social cats when they're playing, and then these mites will be wandering off the bodies, and then the others will easily get it. The big question is always how they first get it. Is it from, you know, some male lions which they went wandering somewhere and they picked it and when they are mating they bring it to them? Or, as I said earlier, we have seen buffaloes also getting affected by mange and the other animals that also get affected, like the wildebeest, also get affected by mange. Also kudus apparently which you have lots of kudos here, get mange infection. And possibly, when they hunt them, they would possibly get them as they feed them on the skin. And, you know, it's very easy to, for the mites to get to a different uh, or the other type of animal. And what the mites will do, they just come and, using their fangs, dig burrows on the skin of the animals and will mate there, will lay eggs, will see the lava there and the nymphs and they start affecting the whole species. But sometimes when I think of mange as an infection, it could be a good balance for these animals. 
So, Mora, is there any chance that they could you know, survive through the mange? I would say yes. If what I gathered before, that they were in very bad shape a couple of months ago, and what I can see now, I would say these lions will make it, and they'll make it through. If they were to die, I think they would have died long time ago. And as I just said, mange has been found out also as a stabilizer. And if a population like this is self-sustaining, these lions, for example, I see them making it. If they would die, they would have died way back. And we have sometimes seen mange as, you know, a way for Mother Nature to balance the population of animals, and for this case, maybe the lions. And this whole pride is still surviving. So chances are, yeah, that one got a torn ear there, as much as trying to break a stick. I, I got a feeling this pride will make it through. Magic Dragon Wizard, your question is, is the Nukuhuma pride larger than the Styx pride? I think the Nukuhumas are 11 total and the Styx are 13. So I think or I believe this pride is much bigger than the Nukuhuma. But the Nukuhumas, they look much healthier and in good shape than these ones. They were seen earlier today in the morning and where we, they were, we tried to go through there, but we were not very lucky to see them. So, you see, that's very touching for lions. And as I was saying earlier, if the one on the right has, you know, the mites, as it's just touching with the other one, as they are grooming there, uh, aloe grooming and reestablishing the, the bones, that's how the mites would get from one and get into the other one. Because there are times you don't have the mites, you know, burrowed on their skin. They could be just be on the far. And easily, if they would feel some heat or some like different species, they would easily move to the next one and get a room and get a space to burrow. And by so doing, they get to the other lioness and affect it. Schmidt, you're asking how far have a lion pride ever moved? A few things come in play here, Schmidt, and I would say number one is always if there's concern of the habitat, I'm not sure that one's trying to chew that stick as a toothpick, if there's a concern of them getting any threat, I would now say from humans, they are known to move very far away and do not want to take any chances. But if it's a question of prey, the longest I've seen, and this, maybe this could be in East Africa, could be about 30 odd miles or 20 miles away from an area. And that I'm talking of a whole pride. And that's quite a distance for a pride to go. The male lions will go maybe twice that distance, but the pride, the females, you know, because of having the cubs and being very energy efficient, they may not go far. But I would say uh, 30 miles or 20 odd miles, Schmidt, they have, you know, known to go. These prides here, the sticks, the times, you know, we don't see them for days. And we'll hear they've been seen in the neighboring game reserve and when you work out the exact location they are it always amount to that distance sometimes even up to 30 miles away why well, are you enjoying chewing the stick see like when young children got teething problems they'll always put stuff in their mouth so just having fun it's crushing the stick there they had a very good meal last night of the Waterback. Maybe to feel is good for the teeth. All right, we are now moving from some cut to some kind of reptile. Well, everyone, I've come down to Chitwa Chitwa Dam. Uh, we're watching Vladimir, the crocodile. Uh, I had to leave uh, Tengana. He did not stop moving, and he's headed straight east, um, and he's out onto Chitwa Plains, uh, Cheetah Plains already, sorry. Um, so he's moving back towards where we found him quite a long time ago with those uh, two impala kills, and maybe... Maybe he's moving in that direction for a while. Maybe he'll be back tomorrow. Who knows? But uh, very interesting that he's headed out that far again. Um, you know, we can put all sorts of focus or, you know, thoughts on that. But uh, uh, the ultimate is, is that he's his own person. He's his own leopard. And he'll do whatever he pleases. 
as far as uh, other leopards will allow, I, I suppose. Now, I just wanted to clear something up from a little bit earlier, uh, because there was a question around um, uh, what happens, uh, you know, with um, with Tingana mating with Tandi. Now, um, I was thinking about a few different things at, at once there. My answer still stands around leopards and inbreeding. Um, that, that's, uh, I was uh, answering in a generic tone. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that Tingana came from somewhere in the Kruger. Nobody really knows who his mother or his father was. Um, and so he's, uh, he, he's not um, mating with his family with uh, Tandi. Now, he's had a few different uh, cubs with Tandi, and it's a very good mixture of genes because of where he He's come from so there's not inbreeding there um, however with you know cubs of his own uh, or through the female and so on there is always an opportunity that uh, he might mate with them and, and so on so that, that's what I was thinking and excuse me for for insinuating that um, they were family to start with I didn't mean that I just got caught up in a, a few different thought processes but uh, let's get back to the matter at hand uh, Vladimir back in his um, normal position I would say that we find him uh, flat out with his uh, very real crocodile smile <laughs> Narika you say he looks like a sleeping dragon I think I think that's quite fitting isn't it looks like he's something out of Lord of the Rings and it, very much a smiling sleeping dragon those very big teeth there on the sides, but sleeping all the same. Those eyes are shut tight. Nancy, I would not put the tip of my big toe in this water. There's enough crocodiles here to uh, snap off uh, little loose toes. And no, I would definitely not be going swimming in there. Um, the crocodiles aside, uh, the hippos, I think, wouldn't uh, be too happy about us uh, joining the fray. As you see there, they're watching us even on the banks. So I think if you got out of the water and went for a little swim there, um, I think you might find yourself in a bit of trouble because there's enough hippos around here uh, to possibly scrum you on your way in. And once you're in the water, I think uh, you'll be snapped in half it's quicker than you can say hippopotamus. But there are lots of them around. Some of them starting to come out of the water there. Oh, so little youngsters coming out of the water. Well, it seems like Rafiki Dave's got the little cubs playing too. Yeah, youngsters coming out of the dam and the youngsters here becoming more playful than before. So these cubs have been playing with sticks and crushing them and trying to be more mobile now as it's cooling off. Going down, picking grasses in their mouth, getting some dry sticks in their mouth, chewing them. I'm not sure it gives them some good feeling on their gums. And very interesting to see the sticks with young uh, cubs like this. Having seen the Nukuhumas yesterday, I saw one female that seemed to have some circling marks. See how playful this can be, eh? Isn't that cute? Norika, I mean, the females here, you're asking how old are these females? I don't know for a fact how old they are, but they are fully grown. But the cubs, I would guess, they're six or seven months old. But the females here are mature because they are the mothers of these cubs here. But I would guess the cubs could be anything six, seven months. But that's a guess. As I said early in the morning, uh, Norika, I don't know if you're watching. Uh, I just saw this particular pride for the first time today. Can see how playful they can be, eh? <laughs> how cute is that? Come on, bring your leg, bring your paw, move forward. Okay, what game are you going to play now? Okay, I'm tired, but one is like, no, let's keep playing. And the mothers get excited when they see the cubs playing like this. That helps mainly because they need to build their muscles when they play like that. When time comes for them maybe to start hunting, they'll be in good body shape. 
the only thing I like other animals. They just play for a short time, then they rest. Sorry, what did Marcy say? Look. Marcy, I agree with you. This is beyond cute. Yes, and how playful Marcy are they? Look at that. Oh, their belly is up. They're just wrestling each other, eh? <laughs> I hope you're enjoying all that moment there, Marcy. Come on, bring your cheek. And the mother should just be, you know, happy seeing the cubs playing. All right, from one cut to another spotted cut. We have got her again. Infrared is on. We've been left alone in the sighting. And she's been moving around, positioning herself nicely, eating, munching away at the dacre. Still no sign of the rebellious youngster. Uses those front teeth to pluck fur, and then the side carnassial shear of those teeth to cut and to shear off hard pieces and sinewy pieces. We as humans invented the steak knife. We are not true predators, omnivores. Our molars are designed for grinding, not for shearing. In the canine, that's what, in carnivores, it's what makes carnivores, is that sharp carnassial shear set of teeth on the outside of the jaw. If you don't know what I'm talking about, let us know next time one of us are in the tent and we'll show it to you on uh, the many skulls that we have there. If you look at a zebra's skull, you'll see the teeth are very flat. So grazers have got very flat sort of teeth. Browsers have got very jagged molars, which allows it to break up the food to very small particles, the leaf material. Omnivores would have a sort of a mixture between. And then the, cane, the carnivores have got very sharp cutting teeth. The canines are for fighting and for subduing prey. Mr. Public, she's eaten the most of it yet. Uh, she is busy chewing. I think what she's doing, she's not looking for the skin, really, or the fur. She's eating uh, most of the meat out of the body of the animal. And then it gets to sort of furry places where she's trying to get some sinew and maybe some meaty bits out. And so that's why she's getting quite delicate in there. Um, they want to maximize and get as much out as they can. But they don't necessarily want to eat the fur. There's no real benefit in the fur. It just leads to them coughing it all up in a fur ball. But as much of the meat and, and possibly skin as they can get, they quite often leave a fair bit of skin behind. That's why also you'll often find leopards when they feed, they'll pluck the fur out of the skin and then eat around it. Eat those patches. B.J. Williams, I have no idea. I don't think so. I don't think that that happens. I mean, there is a very, very strangely documented case of a, of a leopard that killed a baboon. And then after killing the baboon, it found this baby baboon attached to its body and then ended up um, adopting the baboon for the evening. Obviously, the leopard didn't quite know what to do with the baby baboon and it ended up dying of exposure it was a relatively cold night. I think when you're a really small baby, you need to be really tucked up in mum's breast to keep warm when you're a baboon, that is. So I didn't quite know what to make of the little baboon. I don't know if it ended up eating it afterwards, but 
definitely killed its mother. But a lion adopting a leopard? I don't think so. I don't know, maybe one of the viewers out there seen something like that before. It's not something I've ever heard of. Cursed FC said that a, a lion adopted a leopard up in the Mara not so long ago. Very interesting, but no report there of how long that lasted. You know, it might just be like that little novelty initially, but uh, as soon as they find out it's there, one of their arch enemies, it's, they just kill it. It's, there's so much instinct behind it. But very interesting behavior, indeed. We've never heard of that before. Anyone else out there? I know there's a lot of viewers who spend a fair bit of time watching and researching. Any of you give us some insight into a lioness adopting a leopard cub? The successes of that? And why would the leopard cub need adopting? Did mum die? That happens. Very sad, indeed. Still crunching away. Well, we still haven't seen Tlalumba, but David has got cubs playing around. One of the best things to happen to the cats is when the temperatures go down because that translates to more action or to more movement or to them becoming playful and especially these young cubs here. <coughs> Excuse me. And these two are not getting tired of wrestling each other and by so doing strengthening their muscles. It's very typical for cubs. As they mature, at one point they know they'll be living on their own, or not necessarily, if they are, of course, bears, they may have to move. Is that one biting their own ear or the paw? <laughs> Could it some things pulling there, some kind of branch? Must be a very playful one. I think it got a very good feeling when to bite something in the mouth. And I'm sure you can tell now we have gone to IR. Ideally, the whole idea is that we do not invade the animal space, we do not influence or affect their behavior by like shining any spotlights on them. Yeah, it's something I just wish you have some juice. It's like, you know, when I was a small boy, how I used to chew some sugar cane and I could put a big sugar cane in my mouth and my mom was like, that's too big for you, get it out. So this one, I don't think it's getting any juice any sap from that stick just enjoying playing with it but it should be careful it doesn't get hurt because it might jump and then it might end up on the gum eh? having its best of the world eh? while the adults are not concerned <laughs> yes, Luke and everyone in the FC are trying to imagine David the sugar cane as a boy, you know, and I could not let go and I could have a sugar cane that was taller than me. And my mom was like, don't waste it. If you can't finish it, have a small piece, you know. But these ones have a different understanding of a sugar cane, but they've got a dry stick and they've got no sap or juice in it. How playful are they? Isn't that fun, eh? Uh, you wouldn't even think there's any condition of, you know, mange in this particular pride of lions here. I mean, it doesn't seem to be affect them, affecting them in any way. Apart from, you know, the condition that it gets on their skins, I do not think, you know, internally mange is quite a concern until they get, you know, very dehydrated. When they get hit so badly by it, they'll get very dehydrated and then emaciated, and then maybe they die. But normally you'll see the skin condition not looking very good. But these ones look like they're pulling through. And internally, I do not think the mange would affect any internal organ. What would happen is, I would, I would guess for the cubs like this, because of that condition, they don't eat very well, and because of, you know, being malnourished, they would easily be abandoned, or they may lack food, and that way they may die. I'm sure, you know, one of the causes of lion cubs' death 
is abandonment or you know starving I think starving should be number one and then being abandoned by their mother is number two so if they would get very weak because of mange mothers would move on and just forget them and you have seen once or twice you know a dead cub in the middle of nowhere and if you look at it carefully you notice it was suffering from mange I've been wondering if you know the the coalition of mayors around here are the Birmingham's and their vocals has anybody been able to see them with that condition because definitely I would guess unless otherwise they are the fathers of these cubs and it's you know coming in contact direct contact with an infected you know animal that you pick up the mites and you get an infection I wonder whether these cubs were sired by their vocals or the Birmingham's and anybody have seen their Birmingham's or their vocals with any sign of mange because you don't need you know a lot of contact slight contact as I said the mites could be just wandering off on the skin of, of the infected one and easily get into another that's not infected and they've been crisscrossing areas and their territories have been overlapping also with the Nukuhumas and Nukuhumas have not had mange and I would imagine they have laid in the same areas because there's some animals for example the foxes if a fox is infected and it's ring on a barrel and then it moves and another fox comes in and it raises in the same barrel it easily picks the mites and it also gets mange it gets infected I'm trying to imagine these lions you know with this particular pride within comas at one point they have crisscrossed either shared some water pan or some bedding in areas they lay they tend to use particular areas for some reasons as cats would do how the new humans have come out of it could be a big nice debate Oh, very good I just confirmed from Luke the Birmingham's have mange and yes that's of course very good way thank you very much Luke for letting me know that because yeah contact is one of the easiest or is one of the uh, best way to infect mange from one you know one, one animal to another so any any contact of a kind is one way and as I said foxes if you lay somewhere down and a fox have a barrow and you move on another fox come in there chances are the one that was there if it had an infection of mange the new one that comes in will definitely pick either the eggs and most of the larva or the nymph of the mite and get infected thank you for letting me know that look so the big ones now just waking up and looking around the cubs are not playing as before stop look sometimes just listen Ruby how are you and that's a very good question will the cubs be hidden or will they go with their dots for the hunt I would say it will depend Ruby on what they'll be going for if it's something big and dangerous the cubs will be hidden and told to stay put but say if a small animal and not very far from where these lions are they might tag along but if it involves a bit of chase the cubs always stay hidden somewhere until the mothers get the kill sometimes on an open area the cubs will steal an area or in a vantage point for example a termite mound on top of a log where they can see the parents hunting and maybe learn a few skills here and there these particular ones are really aloe grooming not sure they're trying to get the mites out I'm not sure that's aloe grooming or trying to bite and from my lions let's find out what Steve got with his spotted cat Yes, well, she's moved away from the remains of her kill there, leaving what was left, the scraps. She's moved a good 60 yards or so to where she will then clean herself. Still no sign of her youngster. She's moved at least to where there's a, a decent enough tree for her to quickly scurry up if anything happens. But it's quite common behavior, in my opinion, to see a leopard 
once they've uh, once they've finished, especially if there's not too much left, just a bit of a smell to move off a safe distance. Something cheetah do very often, just in case a hyena does come out of nowhere. There's a nice sort of branch for her to jump onto. She can clean herself with no direct sort of attraction for whatever's coming in. And no doubt what we saw this afternoon when we found the other remains of that dacre from yesterday, where we found that scat about 60 meters away. It's possibly it's just underneath a nice big marula tree. It's possibly exactly what she did as well. She moved off, sat under that tree, ready to jump up if need be. And then obviously at some point there was an ablution stop. A very similar tactic taken right here. She cleans all the blood off of her face. <laughs> Have any of you been licked by a domestic cat? I wonder what a leopard's tongue is like. I've seen lions and leopard licking the flesh off of an animal. There she is. I hear a noise coming off towards my left. We are infrared. We have got no lights on. Ruby, yes, I'm sure she'd be able to go after a scrub hair or anything smaller like that. A little noise in the left here. Yeah? How has Tandy reacted to it? I heard another movement. She hasn't reacted at all. She was looking. So Talamba will go after something small, most definitely. I don't know if she'll catch it, though, but she'll definitely try. And once she catches it, you won't quite have the killer instinct behind her to, to, to end its life. And she's going in the other direction. And we're going to try to catch up. Obviously, we're not going to be using any lights. See how we do. Charlie Universe, no, I think perfectly, she's perfectly at that sort of stage. Um, we, watch out the... Aerial there, Crago. We might lose you for a second, folks. Rexon said he saw Tlalamba, but I didn't see her. So we haven't seen her here. Tony's not behaving like she's here. Okay, so I'm going to have to just use the spot to see where she goes. We might lose her, though. Some aardvark burrows in and around. So we didn't see Tlalamba this afternoon is what I was saying. What is that over there? Something just behind that bush. Bit of a faulty spotlight here, Craig. Eh? There we go. That looks like her. She just had a little look back at me. Now, she's probably going to go down and have a drink. I need to use the light, otherwise I'm going to fall into a hole. I think we should be good going this way. The aardvark seems to like digging on the top of the hill. That's where we find Hukumuri these days. Okay, well, we're going to see if we can catch up with her. She's probably going down for a drink. Hello, hello, hello. We are looking for night critters like little chameleons here in the leaves. We haven't spotted any just yet, but uh, we're going to keep searching now in the darkness hours. They do like coming out onto the bush willow type trees, not really particularly where there's lots of thorns. So I often look in those kind of bushes, but uh, we'll also be looking for any of the little. Um, uh, genets and I, I'm really looking forward to seeing a civet so that's what I'm hoping for in the next little while while it's dark now I haven't seen a civet in a long time but I've seen a lot of their tracks recently so I'm just hoping that we see something now you normally see them just walking up the road in front of you that's how I've had most of my civet uh, sightings and I've also bumped into them a couple of times on foot and when I say bumped into them, it's, you know, they'll, and I just want David to show you, just here off on the side, they'll go and sleep in a, 
just a, a big bunch of grass like that and um, so when you're walking uh, it's quite easy to bump into them as I say I nearly walked on top of uh, a few of them and then they jump out and it's it's not a it's not a tiny animal so um, yeah it's uh, can make you uh, get quite a surprise and we do have those heart attack birds which are the Franklin and the Spurfowl that jump out next to you um, and I tell you your heart skips a beat but wait for a civet to jump out in front of you it, um, it has a slightly uh, better effect on, on, the, on the nerves I would say uh, you need a bit of a cold shower after that but um, yeah just looking for any of these nighttime animals now, Karen, if you're a guest and you come to one of these uh, safari lodges here in this area, what happens is normally you have your very early morning game drive and, um, and then an afternoon game drive. So you normally have three hours in the morning and three hours in the afternoon. And then during the midday, after your morning drive, you, ha you normally have an option of going for a bush walk as well. Um, but you can also, at some of the lodges, uh, you know, change your drive for a walk. Uh, or, and that be in the morning or in the afternoon um, because you know for me taking a bushwalk in the heat of the day is not ideal so I normally suggest to my guests um, to to especially if they're staying you know for more than two nights or so um, to forego one of the morning drives and then we go out for a walk Especially, you know, as I say, if you've got a little bit more time, because if you've got a short amount of time, then obviously you do want to see, you know, as much as possible in terms of elephants, lions, leopards. It's never guaranteed, but it is, you know, if you've come all the way across around the world, uh, you definitely do want to try and see those animals, especially if that's the reason why you have come in the first place. But, as I say, it is the wild and it can never be guaranteed. But coming to a place like the Sabi Sands, and you can almost guarantee seeing leopards. That is uh, one of the real special things about this area. Because there's lots of other areas that you can see a lot of elephants and lions, and more so than here. But um, to guarantee or almost guarantee seeing leopards and the amount of them in such a small space, as habituated as these ones are to vehicles and guides on foot, um, it's this is I would say probably one of the best places in the world for that well you can tell me if you know of a place better than the Sabi Sands to do that and uh, well I'll I'll definitely listen now Punisher uh, you're asking uh, you know around the numbers of animals and over a period of time what is that is that just a daker I think it's a Dianboki. Yep, this is Dianboki. We don't want to bother him because he's a night, uh, a daytime animal. And uh, if we shine the light on him and just disturb him there, then uh, he might change his, his habits for no good reason. So, Punisher, I think, you know, there might be more or less uh, animals than there were 10 years ago, but there's always a fluctuation in accordance with the resources and the weather and climate of the particular period. Um, and I'm just trying to think back 10 years ago. What would we be there? 2008, um, I was also in the Kruger National Park area. Um, and I, I, I can't say just off of the top of my head that I feel like there's any less animals. Um, obviously, as my thought process is going, um, I'm just saying that, you know, uh, we get some periods, three, four years of a little bit more drier. We get then subsequently after that three four years a little bit more wet so maybe there's a little bit more resources a little bit of certain different plants growing uh, for a couple of years and then they die back a little bit so I think in terms of just the general cycle of things I think no ten years ago very similar to the way it is now in the Kruger National Park obviously in general I would say in South Africa yes there's less animals now than there were ten years ago but in the national park per se, I would say it's just part of the natural cycle that's going around. Okay, so as I continue looking on for any kind of night creature, I believe Steve, uh, he was with the night creature. I wonder if he still is. 
No, we could not keep up with the pace of Tundi. She just goes straight through the bushes. We've got to go round. So we're going to try one more effort. Uh, she kind of headed sort of westish from where she was, and um, it's likely she might be thirsty. So maybe she's going to go to Gallego Watering Hole. We're going to do a little loop around there and see if indeed that is what has transpired. But um, there was still no. By the time we we lost her there, there was still no sign of. Cl oh, sorry, Craig of Talamba and she didn't make any calls any calls at all so maybe after Talamba's sort of behavior of stealing food and stuff mum is leaving her away she's leaving her sort of still in a distance she'll go back to her though no doubt but you, the question before is how independent is she but I think it's pretty normal what's going on at the moment you know the leopard also the youngster needs to be left alone from time to time you know some self-reflection on stealing mum's food <laughs> but a quiet time one would say but it's not uncommon for her to have left her i mean she's been doing that for some time she also gets tired you know she doesn't want to move as far as mum and you know what it's like if you want to go on a hike the youngster doesn't want to go well the youngster's going to stay behind but uh, that is my oof craigo you feel the the degrees drop as we come down into this depression here all of you out there know the laws of gravity and cold air six. Whenever you go through these little sort of drainage depressions, it's a lot cooler down here. Okay, well, before we lose a signal once again with the gremlins, David Gitu has still got his beautiful, or should I say mangy cats. Yeah, I'm still with the mangy cats here, the stick sprite. And, you know, we have always thought it's males that sleep and sleep and sleep, you know, the male lions. But also females, given a chance, they also sleep. We already say, you know, lions will sleep 15, 20 hours in a day. But I think I would also start saying even females sleep more or less the same. Why should they not? If they're very well fed and they have enough to drink and bang energy FEH cuts, the only thing they want to do is sleep. So you can see, I left these, you know, cats in the morning sleeping, found them sleeping, and they're still there. Stacy, how are you today? And you are asking, it seems a lot darker earlier. Yes, because it's winter, and this will go on this month of June and the whole of July until we come to August, we come to summer, and we had just earlier than normal because it is winter. If you go to East Africa, we still got enough light at the moment. Six o'clock, there's a lot of light, and I would guess if we'd be out on a game drive, we'd not be using IR. You're right, Stacy, it's just because it's winter. And, you know, these lions sleep and they sleep a lot. Alison Ray, you watch the Swahili word for today. I do not know whether you know what we call lions in Swahili. I would guess that one you know. And we call them Simba, S I M B A, Simba. So, because I'm wishing these lions well, and I want to hope, you know, the mange will be out of them, the infection will go very soon. When things are good in Swahili, we say sawa sawa, and that is S A W A S A W A. So, I read, Sona lady, your word for today, of course, I would guess you know what Simba is. It's like, okay, okay, all is good, and you say sawa sawa. So you're one class up, unlike Hakuna Matata, so I want you now to go to a different level and you start saying sour sour from today. So if we hopefully we see this spread of lions, maybe the next uh, one, two months from now, the infection of the mange will be gone and we say these lions or these Simbas are sour sour. So that continue licking itself and the rest you can see pose up and in dreamland enjoying sleep. Life is good, I'm fed, I've enough to drink. Why do I have to worry? But at one point, I'm sure, come maybe 10 o'clock, I'm sure they might move to a different area because for reasons where they were last night, it's not where I found them this morning. And this 
has been a lovely day. And how exciting. Tingana, the bell, you know, Tandi, the queen of this area with her princess, you know, Kalalamba, and now with the stick lions. What a day, eh? I'm thinking it is time now I go and I get my sugar cane, just like that lion cub cam was doing, putting the stick in the mouth. I'm going now to look for my sugar cane and remind myself how I used to do when I was a small boy. It has been a fantastic day and we thank all of you for having joined us. Remember, we'll be with you tomorrow, 0630 hour. Thank you and from all of us, goodbye.